fantastic. This is GT racing right now. He's got tracks and he's got rhythm. Both of them. Maloney. Oh, he's, he's taking Anderson. Anderson's up there. Oh, my God. Oh, that's a big crash. Oh, my goodness. Half the field's going to get rolled. Six very close. These guys are one I want to make their way through the field very quickly. This is it! This is over! I can't believe this! Oh my oh god! My god, what? Speedcafe.com, your number one source for all the latest motorsport news and features. Breaking news, live event updates, unprecedented global motorsport coverage performance motoring news and reviews all in the palm of your hand anywhere anytime speedcafe.com first fast and free It's round two of the Speed Cafe GT3 E-Series presented by King Chrome. And this week, we're off to the iconic Spa Francorchamps circuit in Belgium for another 90-minute endurance race. Good evening, everybody. Lockie Mansell behind the microphone with you, along with Mr. Enthusiasm himself, Bo Albert, as we get set for this professional versus amateur enduro around the seven-kilometre circuit. Very good evening to you, Bo. Looking forward to this one. Absolutely. Spa Frankenstein's always a very interesting circuit. Plenty of high speed corners, big braking zones, and of course, all of the elevation change you could ever want in a racetrack. It's going to be a fantastic race, I think, coming up because, of course, these GT3 cars work fantastic around here. So, hopefully, a few different strategies, a few different strengths and weaknesses between the cars can make for a very, very fun race. I think one of the things that we will say is a lot of slipstreaming, particularly down the long Kemmel Strait, but one of the other things is that this track does have some quite high-speed corners where the GT cars can really exploit their aerodynamics, particularly through the fast double left-hander at Pua and also the very famous Blodschmott high-speed left-hander as well. As mentioned, it will be a 90-minute race, and for those of you who missed the action last week, it was Job Stewart, the BMW Z4 GT3, that took the win from third position on the grid, and in the end, it was a fairly comp comprehensive performance by young Job, the South Australian driver, who's also had a lot of success in real-life motorsport competition in go-karting, and is expected to be racing in the Toyota A6 Series this year. He took the win after running a strategic option of not changing tyres during his pit stop, and that's something that we'll talk a bit more about once we get into the race. Jackson Suzlin Harlow, the Alter Seek Sports Audi R8, finishing up in second position. Andre Heimgart and the Mercedes AMG GT3 routing out podium. So that was how it all played out last week at Indianapolis, but we're at Spa this week, and we're going to bring you coverage from qualifying and racing tonight. And speaking of Jackson Susan Harlow, he will be carrying one of our webcams tonight. There he is on screen in the Ultra Seat Sports Audi R8. 
Absolutely, and I think Jackson will be looking forward to tonight's race because this is going to be a circuit that will actually favour the Audis quite nicely. It's a lot of high speed, downforce and grip reliant corners, which means that Audi is going to be right where it likes it. The Mercedes will be quite strong on the run down the Kimmel straight into the Lacombe section, but other than that, this is pure Audi territory if you can keep it off of those dangerous curves. So one of the other bits of housekeeping that we should cover off is that we do have one less type of car in the field this week. The roof, which is the uh, the modified Porsche, has been removed from the eligibility list for the Speed Cafe GT3 E-Series. And that's basically down to balance of performance and the fact that our series organisers could not get the roof configured to be at an equivalent performance level to the other cars in the field. So the drivers who were in the roof last week at Indianapolis, they've been forced to go away and select a different type of car. As discussed, we will be having a range of web cabs tonight, and one of them will be carried by Andre Heimgartner, the Ned Whiskey Supercars driver for Kelly Racing, who once again is behind the wheel of that bright orange Mercedes AMG GT tonight. Yeah, it definitely stands out just a little bit, this Andre Heimgartner's Mercedes, but it's also got plenty of pace in it as well as he comes across the line to set a time to get himself into the top seven provisionally in car number seven as well. It's a very nice work indeed from Andre Heimgartner, who's going to be a real talking point, I think, in this race, because we did see him as the lead pro driver at Indianapolis. So in that regard, he's got a little bit of weight on his shoulders coming into this race at Spa, because this is still a Mercedes track in some aspects with the long straights that are, are featured around this circuit. But otherwise, uh, he's got the weight of having to perform as the top pro driver currently in the series. And you've got to imagine that some of the other guys are putting a bit of pressure on him for that reason, because it's not an easy feat to go in being third in the championship and being the lead gun against such a flurry of sim races. Indeed. Here is Dalton Ellery on screen at the moment. Another driver's been carrying one of our webcams. He was one of the drivers who was in the roof last week, so he's opted to switch to the Ferrari for this week's round. And just, again, we've had a very big entry list, so lots of drivers trying to get themselves into the field for tonight. So once again, we are running a couple of qualifying sessions concurrently. We can only obviously broadcast one of those qualifying sessions, which is the one that we're bringing to you at the moment. But once the qualifying sessions have been completed, we will amalgamate the times and that will give us our starting grid for the 90 unit race. Just one of the other bits of housekeeping as well, Bo, you mentioned there about Andre Heimgartner being the best pro drivers last week, which indeed he was. However, Job Stewart has since been reclassified as a pro driver based on his go-karting achievement and also the fact that he is planning to race in the Toyota 86 Series this year. So it's now actually Jackson Suzlin Harlow, second in the championship, who finds himself as the highest place to be amateur drivers, as it were. And it's the amateur drivers that are eligible for the fantastic prizes that we've got on the line, thanks to our major sponsor, King Chrome Tools. No, absolutely. I think that's going to be a really interesting thing there for Jackson, Susan Harlow in that Audi to now be the uh, lead sim race, so to say, with the uh, Job Stewart getting reclassified. And like you say, there are some fantastic prizes on offer. So Jackson will not be upset in the slightest to see that he's got a slight edge now on Job Stewart in regards to going for that prize. And there are some fantastic prizes being offered all throughout the season. So uh, he'll be very happy with that. Let's take you through, in fact, the championship points as they stand coming into tonight's race. So on top of the ladder at the moment, Job Stewart, our race winner from last week on 150 points. Second place, Jackson Susan Harlow, right on cue, we get the graphic up on screen, 138 points. Andre Heimgartner in third on 129, back to Jack Boyd in fourth position on 120. Jamie Craig, 111 points in position five. Back to Robert Prysdale in sixth position on 102 points. Matt Lapino, 96. Mitchell McLeod, 90. Paul Auditore, 84. And Louis Paul O'Gallon routing out the top 10 on 78 points. Louis Paul O'Gallon was actually running inside a podium position late in the race last week, but unfortunately copped a bit of a tap from Shane Van Gisbergen, which spent, sent him spinning outside of the top 10. Van Gisbergen was penalised for that incident. And just up on screen as well, some of the balance of performance adjustments that have been made. The series organisers can add weight to cars. They can also restrict engine power of cars. 
one of the other things that they can do is they can also tweak fuel capacity of the cars as well based on their fuel range. Very similar to what we've seen in real life GT3 series like the Blanc Pad series where the organisers are always tweaking the balance of performance to make sure that all, all of the cars can contain on a level playing field. And the thing here, Bo, is that the car's not going to be identical. They are still going to have strengths and weaknesses in different parts of the racetrack, but what you try and what you want to try and achieve is a situation where the cars are going to be doing pretty much the same lap time. Absolutely, and that's the common goal of balanced performance. Get all the cars on an equal playing field, so at the end of the day, if the team or driver does find that slight edge, whether it's in driving style or setup, they are still going to be the team that wins. They're not going to be winning races purely based on their car choice but we know that's not always the case and that sometimes there are cars that have a certain preference to circus i mentioned a little bit earlier the audi r8 very very good when it comes to these high speed corners around a circuit like spa the mercedes a lot of power in a straight line really able to pull plenty of torque and get that straight line speed going quite nicely and then the ferrari 488 italia it's not the best accelerating car but once it's in a slipstream and got the straight line open road ahead of it will go flying past any other car around. So strengths and weaknesses are a big, big talking point when it comes to GT3. And I've got to say right now, looking at the times, we have a BMW on pole with a uh, Audi in second and then a Ferrari in third. I've got to say, I think the crew behind this series right now have done a fantastic job. I think they've done a sensational job and again, particularly getting a media outlet of the calibre of Speed Cafe on board to promote this series and to cover it through all of their very, very highly rated channels. You know, it's excellent, not just for the series, but for sim racing in general. Let's talk about a bit of a controversial topic, Bo. Track limits. It was a big subject last night in the Circuit XLA series race where we had a number of drivers abusing track limits throughout the race. Obviously, in qualifying, you have to make sure that you stay within the bounds of the racetrack because if you don't, your lap time will be disallowed, but in the race, it'll be something for us to watch as well. No, absolutely. And that's where one of the good things about this series is we have live race control behind the scenes. You can actually monitor what teams and drivers are doing. And around a high-speed corner, like our track map up on screen, like Blanchimont or Ar Rouge, they are corners that are very easily extended where the drivers can not take the full uh, racing... Well, they take too much of the racing surface, I should say, going beyond the curbing or the white line on the outside of the circuit. And that allows them to carry even more mid-corner speed and exit speed through the corner. That is a big, big advantage. The race stewards and the live stewards who are watching over this race can have a look at that and if there's anyone they think is going to do it a little bit on purpose and is doing it excessively throughout the race, well, they can be handed a drive-through penalty at any point, right down to the steward's discretion. And just to add to your point there, obviously, people will understand that if you shortcut the circuit, then that's obviously an advantage because you're making the corner shorter and you're making the track shorter than it should be. But if you run wide, over the exit curb coming out of the corner, that can give you an advantage as well because it allows you to carry more corner speed. So that's the other thing our live race control officials will police over the course of the evening. Just over five minutes remaining in qualifying and it's our round one winner and our championship leader, Job Stewart, on top at the moment by the tiniest of margins. 0.01 of a second separating our first place BMW driver from our second placed Audi driver, Jackson Susan Harlow. It is seriously tight at the top of the order. Chris Lazarevich, the former New South Wales Formula Ford competitor, sits in third position. And then it's Louis Paulo Gallen, Jack Boyd, John Martin in sixth position, ahead of Andre Heimgartner, Matt Lupino, Jeff Connell, and Jaden Ransley completing the top 10. And it's a good mix of cars in that little list as well. We've got the BMW, Ferrari, Audi, and Mercedes all floating around the top uh, 10 in your uh, field at the moment, which is great to see, of course. There is one more uh, session going on in the background that we don't have eyes on. So there is another qualifying session with a whole flood of other drivers competing for the fastest lap time they can in qualifying. But I've got to say, the lack of McLarens at the top of the field has to be said that that is a little bit of a shame to see because we do love a McLaren fighting up the front. Yeah, last week it was Fraser Ross, wasn't it, who flew the McLaren flag. And the thing that we love about the McLarens in particular is those really cool flames that you get to see shooting out of the exhaust, particularly when we go to the camera angle when you're looking out the back of the car. So hopefully 
in one of the other qualifying sessions that's running concurrently with this one. We do have some McLaren drivers punching out some fast times. Just having a bit of a look at the timing at the moment, uh, one driver who's a bit further down than where we probably would have expected, Paul Auditore, who actually works full-time as a number one mechanic for the Tickford Supercars team. He's scored down in 21st position at the moment, but he is inside the top 10 in the championship. So you would expect him to be looking to move up. Again, one of the things and one of the traps for all of the drivers is those track limits. You can be on a good lap, but if you step even slightly wide and the iRacing software determines that you've exceeded the track limits, your lap time gets disallowed. So that's one of the things that the drivers have to be really, really careful of. And I've got to say, I think Paul Auditore might have just overstepped that mark through pool one on that particular lap. We'll have a look at Jackson Suslin Harlow as he goes through the exact same section in just a couple of moments time. But this is a corner that very easily pings a lot of drivers. If you run too wide here out onto the Astro turf, that is your lap done. You can see Jackson being very, very cautious when it comes to his outside track limit use. And it does keep the lap valid on this particular occasion. But Paul Auditore not quite as lucky it's one of those things that's very very clear or should i say black and white in regards to how it's ruled there's no gray areas the software either says you're in or you're out there's no ifs or buts jackson susan and harlow we keep talking about him as one of the hottest young talents of the aussie sim racing scene at the moment has quite a bit of success in go-karts in real life it was announced late last week that he'll be teaming up with dylan o'keefe for the ARG Esports Cup two-hour twin driver endurance race that's happening at Bathurst on Thursday night. And speaking of that, Bo, I believe you've got a bit of news in regards to that as well. I do have a little bit of news in regards to that, but I can't say anything publicly right now in regards to who I'll be driving oh. with. Uh, I've got to keep... Oh. Uh, I've got to keep the uh, got to keep the you on your toes, you know. But no, I will be competing in that, and I think that's going to be a fantastic event to round off what has been a fantastic ARG Esports Cup series. And uh, I know a lot of drivers are looking forward to that. And some of the sim racers uh, have got some very scary lineups going on with who they're pairing with is a uh, real world driver. So I know Harley Haber is rumored to be paired up with Ford's and Nabi. And I know for a lot of the other competitors, including myself, that is a very worrying thing. I think it is. I think that that's going to be a, a dynamite combination. Actually, there's some really good driver combinations. And if you want the latest news and in innuendo on who's driving with who, just tune in to or log on to simracingoz.com tomorrow morning because I'll be publishing an update and a list of all of the driver combinations that have been either confirmed or strongly rumoured in the last couple of days. Watching Paul Mansell on screen, no relation to yours truly, but rocking a very cool livery on the number 5 BMW Z4 GT3. No, absolutely. It's a good-looking car indeed, and uh, you're a fan of the number apparently, so I'll, I'll let you have it, but definitely a very cool-looking livery, I've got to say. It's a livery that uh, is very, very uh, easy to spot in a crowd of cars, so to say. It's the cliche with plenty of flames all around it, but of course being sponsored by Burn uh, does look very, very cool indeed. But uh, making their way around a lap right now on an 18.5 in qualifying, which is very, very competitive overall, but they're only going to get one more lap as Paul Mansell to uh, attack this uh, spa Francorchamps circuit. Across the line to start off this lap, he'll go, but he's going to have to pull something out big to improve on his current position. As we take a look at Tyler Collins, who goes flat through Blanchimont. A very fast corner, runs very wide indeed. He might just get away with that. Be very nip and tuck if he does, but hard on the brakes into the bus stop chicane. Gets the first apex. Overshot a little bit there. The car just wants to understeer beyond the uh, second apex there and then onto the power. Currently fastest lap for him is an 18.7. He will round off the session, sadly, with an off track. Another car that's really well presented, though, with those chrome panels on the rear. Here comes Jackson Suslin Harlow to complete what will be his final flying lap. In fact, he doesn't because he's headed back into the pits to abort the lap. So no opportunity there for Jackson Suslin Harlow to respond to the time of Job Stewart. Two minutes, 17.0. Here comes Chris Lazarevich in the Ferrari, currently third fastest within this session up to the line. Takes the chequered flag. And he goes within tenth of his best lap time of the session, but no improvement for him either. He stays in P3. 
He does. I'm just looking at a couple of other drivers who are on laps at the moment. A lot of drivers look like they're finished. We're looking at John Martin at the moment. My timing screen is showing him as actually having already completed or come across the line as the checkered flag has fallen. But we'll have a look anyway, because he is still pushing on more than definitely as he throws the car into Blanchimont. We'll see what the Z4 can do, because at the moment, I believe he is, besides Job Short, one of the only BMWs actually in this qualifying session that we're broadcasting right now. John Martin attacks deeply into the bus stop, gets a very nice run though, and we'll see if this lap does in fact count. Currently on a 17.9 as his fastest lap, he'll come across the line. It's only going to be an 18-1, so no improvement there, sadly, for John Martin. John Martin had a pretty tough start to the championship last week as well, unfortunately. Had good pace, but got caught up in some incidents and ended up with no points as we look at another really well-presented car. Brady Car, the Audi R8, and he is rocking the livery that we saw in Season 1 of the Carbon Gaming GC3 A-Series, which is the Tony Bates Racing Bostic Alternative Freight Services Audi R8 livery, and there is Brady Car coming across the line, and he does improve, in fact, and moves up into position 17. So... That completes qualifying for round number two of the Speed Cafe GT3 A-Series. Now it'll be down to our ever hard-working officials in the background to combine all of our times from the qualifying sessions to give us our grid positions for the race, which is coming up very shortly. But provisional results, Job Stewart, our points leader, fastest ahead of Jackson Suslin Harlow, Back to Chris Lazarevich in third spot. Louis Paulo Gowan, Jaden Ransley, Jack Boyd, John Martin, Andre Heimgarten, and Matt Lapino, and Jeff Connell routing out the top 10. Robert Crisdale will provisionally kick things off from 11th with Kobe Williams lining up on the sixth row of the grid. Paul Mansell in the number five that Lockie Mansell has picked out as a favorite of his will kick things off from 13th with James Foster and Tyler Collins, the top 15. Daniel Yeaman will start, will, will finish this qualifying session from 16th. Brady Carr and Jack Cafode, 17th and 18th respectively with Jamie Craig and Ben Blaze, your top 20. Back to Michael Gurry in 21st position. Lockie Hughes in 22nd ahead of Dalton Ellery, our series organiser. Paul Auditore down in 24th ahead of Justin Ford. Zach Nickel, who will be rocking one of our webcams tonight in 26th. Back to Jared Hughes. William Yarwood, the former Aussie racing car driver in 28th position. Sam Batty in 29th. And then Oscar Target in position 30. From 31st, it will be Fraser Ross, who I have noticed is now sporting an Audi R8 LMS for this race. So we'll see what the stewards say about that for a car swap. But Stephen Ellery will kick things off on the same row of the grid with Steve Johnson, Beric Linton, and Craig Gurry, the last of your drivers to set lap times in that session. So the field spread, uh, including the entire 35 cars between 6.3 seconds. But for your top drivers right at the front of the field, we know it's a whole lot closer than that. And we haven't even combined the times yet. So for all we know, there could have been some other very, very fast drivers in one of the other sessions as well. So what we might do now is we might actually bring in the driver who was fastest in that qualifying session. He also happens to be our championship leader, Joe Stewart. Good evening, mate. How are you going? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, thanks. Uh, how was that particular qualifying session for you? Oh, it was pretty good. Nothing else pole was there, I think. Provisional uh, yeah. pole. You were certainly fastest in that session. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, pretty good. It was kind of hard to get a lap in as well because of all the off-tracks, but yeah, managed to sneak one in. Yeah, that was one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, Job. Just how hard is it to keep it within the bounds of the racetrack, particularly through some of those high-speed corners like Eau Rouge and Blanchimont? Yeah, it's pretty difficult. All that, yeah, all those fast corners, they're right on the edge. One mistake can just send you flying off the track and into an off track. So it's super difficult to put a laugh in. Probably the other uh, point of consideration there, Job, is... Um, the effect of the slipstream here at Spa, we know that it can be quite high. Were you successful in getting a tow from anybody else down the long Camel Strain, or did you find that you were actually more easily able to get a fast lap time when you had clear track? Uh, yeah, I felt the tow definitely helped. I got a tow on my first lap, which was maybe two tenths in a tow, and after that I was on my own for the rest of the session. 
So we've got the nine unit race coming up. Now I have to ask you about strategy and I'm not expecting that you'll necessarily give too much away, but we saw last week that you won the race without changing tyres during your one and only pit stop. Do you think that that no tyre strategy will work again tonight or do you think that with perhaps a bit of high tyre degradation here at Spa compared to Indianapolis that we'll see people changing tyres tonight? Uh, yeah, I have to think about it because I think, yeah, this track's definitely got more tyre wear because of all the fast flowing corners and stuff. So, um, yeah, I think it might be worth a shot to think about changing tyres. Yeah, obviously a lot of that's going to depend on where, when we see safety cars and at what point during the race the pit stops are taking place. But congratulations on a great qualifying performance and go well in the race. Thanks, guys. Here we go, Joe Stewart, our pulse here for round number two, provisionally for the Speed Cafe GT3 E-Series. What we might do at this point while we wait for the grid positions to be finalised is we might go to a break here. You are watching all of the action right here on speedcafe.com. This is round number two of Speed Cafe GT3 E-Series presented by King Chrome Tool. Speedcafe.com, your number one source for all the latest motorsport news and features. Breaking news, live event updates, unprecedented global motorsport coverage, performance motoring news and reviews, all in the palm of your hand, anywhere, anytime. Speedcafe.com, first, fast and free. BeCafe.com GT3 series presented by King Chrome will provide an enormous opportunity for amateur racers, young and old, to take on some of the real stars of our sport, the Andrew Heimgartners, the Will Browns, the Thomas Randalls, who've done terrific things in V8 supercars. They'll all have to go head to head with some of these kids that are 13, 14 years old, all wanting to make a name for themselves in the sport. At the moment, there's no opportunity for them to do that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but the online series that we're presenting gives them a real chance in a fun atmosphere, serious atmosphere, but a fun atmosphere to go out and show their stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's awesome. It's, it's something that obviously we've seen with the, with the Supercar E-Series and, and for us to be able to get in and, and keep sharp and obviously with, with the help of you know, King Chrome and Speed Cafe and we've been dabbling in a little bit of e-racing for the last sort of four weeks now and, and to now have, you know, uh, proper, I guess, uh, back series is um, something that's going to be great, not only for myself, but for a lot of the older blokes, Steve Ellery, uh, a lot of the young blokes that are in that we've been racing the last sort of three or four weeks, which is, you know, something that I think that uh, is going to be ongoing once we get, get, get racing again. The great things about the series will be some of the older stalwarts of our sport, the Steve Johnsons, the Steve Ellery's uh, of the sport who've done some terrific things at some memorable places like Bathurst to be racing against some of these kids and racing against their own sons in a controlled atmosphere online and uh, having a lot of fun. Yeah, our father-son combination has been really cool to, to be able to, for myself, be involved with Jet in the last few weeks. But, uh, 
You know, obviously you've got Steve Ellery, Dalton Ellery. Uh, Dalton's put a lot of effort behind this series and, and have really started the ball rolling three or four weeks ago. But um, you know, for Jet and I to be able to get in and share and probably look at out of the six rounds doing three each and see if we can combine our, our I guess, total and our, our uh, championship standings together to be able to you know, hopefully finish up towards the pointy end. Prize and the, 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 I guess the product that's coming on board with, with King Chrome um, attached is just is fantastic. I think that um, there are pro gamers that, that I guess race for money and, and race for, for prizes, but for this and for, for amateur guys to be able to come in and win these sort of products and have this much up for grabs is I think unheard of in Australia. So I think it's for us uh, and for the series, it's a, it's a massive boost. Um, we're gonna have full grids no matter what. And I think they're going to be quality grids. There's going to be a lot of fast guys in there, older guys, younger guys, and it's going to be pretty tough six weeks to be up the front. So everyone's going to have to work pretty hard at you know, getting the prize at the end. You wanted the best, you got them for a rest. Often imitated, never duplicated. The greatest show on dirt, the world of outlaws. Yeah, I think racing all the stars of the sport is going to be pretty cool considering that normally it's not really a thing that's even possible to do on the real racetrack. So I think being able to jump in there virtually and having a bit of, race, a bit of a race against them every week, especially for these great prizes, is going to be pretty good. There's no doubt that E-Series racing and online racing has really taken the world by storm since the COVID-19 pandemic has affected us so greatly. And I think it's terrific that uh, these young blokes get a chance to really race against some of the older blokes that we've seen on many of our own racetracks over the years. Uh, the E-Racing on iRacing is really good. It's, I find it really realistic. I haven't driven many cars in my life, but the ones I have, it's quite similar, I feel. And a lot of the V8 supercar guys like Andre Heimgartner and Will Brown also say the same sort of thing about the supercars and the GT cars because some of the people have driven them and it seems like a good sort of preparation for all your racing and a bit of training as well in the times we're in at the moment. Yeah, I feel like the racing side of it will be what helps me the most on the e-racing because 
it seems that from go-karts, how you battle with someone else is very different to how you do it in the car. So I feel like that actually racing and rubbing door to door with everyone is gonna be a really good thing for me and help me a lot when I start to get into cars. I think it's important for companies like speedcafe.com uh, combined with King Crane, one of our partners, to get right behind these young guys having a real crack and uh, obviously trying to develop their skills in an online setting uh, before they go back to either karting or they go back to uh, you know, XL Hyundai's or even to the lower rates of uh, V8 supercars. Yeah, these, these guys, and this is where I think for myself, it, it, uh, I didn't have this opportunity to, to be able to get that experience on those tracks, but also against drivers like myself and, and some of the professional drivers. So very cool for, for Oscar to be able to come in and, and do this and, and understand what he needs to do to be quick, not only over a race or over a lap, but over a series and actually be fast and finish well in the series. So for me personally, it's very cool because you know, in my lifetime, I'm probably never ever gonna get the chance to race young Oscar. Um, and I've known his dad, John, for a long, long time through go-karting. Um, but you know, Oscar started racing go-karts when my son was sort of just finishing up in that class. So um, you know, they've been around, they've raced together, um, which is really, really cool. But coming in now for him to be able to do this and quite well established in the karting scene, I think is gonna be massive for him and massive for his career. Uh, the King Chrome tools that we've got here today look pretty good. And I think that that's just even more of a incentive for people to go good and have more of a go. Cafe.com, your number one source for all the latest motorsport news and features. Breaking news, live event updates, unprecedented global motorsport coverage, performance motoring news and reviews, all in the palm of your hand, anywhere, anytime. Speedcafe.com, first, fast and free.
You're watching round two of the speedcafe.com GT3 A series presented by King Chrome, which is coming to you live right around the world on Speed Cafe from the iconic Spa Francorchamps circuit in Belgium. Lockie Mansell along with Bo Albert behind the microphone for you. Warm up is underway as we gear up for the night in an endurance race of the news. After we combine the times from the two qualifying sessions is that Joe Stewart ended up not just fastest in the broadcast session, but fastest overall. So he will start the race from pole position. As mentioned, it's a 90 minute race. There will be safety cars. There will be an element of pit strategy. The big question for me, Bo, is what are people going to do in terms of tyre management for this race? We saw last week the winning strategy was to not change tyres during the pit stop. But as Joe Stewart mentioned to us in the interview, the tyre degradation here at Spa is a lot higher than it was at Indianapolis last week. I hope you're not looking for an exact answer, Lockie, because I don't have one for you. It's one of those things that what do you do when it comes to pit strategy? Some will take tyres, some will not. And every race, we've seen things go a little bit differently. At one circuit, like Indianapolis, not taking tyres proved to be the better option at the end. Throw back to last season, you go back to a Phillip Island or a Catalonia round, and taking tyres was the preferred option. The thing with Spa is it is a circuit of two halves. You've got like Sector 1, which is the one from, in my opinion, from the start finish line right down to the Lacombe. That Sector 1, it's all straight. So you've also got Sector 3 uh, coming from uh, Paul Freire Corner all the way back down to the bus stop and then to the finish line again. That's high speed as well. But that middle sector is all cornering forces. So it's a bit hard to decide whether this is a circuit where you want to take tires or don't because there's a lot of straights and a lot of the time off this circuit is on straights but if you don't take tires you are going to be hurting a lot in that middle part of the lap not only that but the middle part of the lap is the part that's going to put a lot of pressure on the tires as well so i think a lot of it is going to depend on where and when the safety cars fall like i said last week if you cast your mind back we had one safety car very early in the race was deployed at the end of the second lap so only a couple of green flag laps were completed before we got our first safety car the next safety car didn't actually arrive until quite late in the race and what that meant was that we saw that the bulk of the field only made the single pit stop if the safety cars were to fall at a slightly different time this week then it would open up for a potential two pit stop strategy again depending on factors such as tyre degradation and also fuel because the cars only have enough fuel on board at the start to get them to about 27 minutes into the race then they're allowed to carry a maximum fuel load that gets them about 58 minutes and you add 58 and 27 and you get 85 which is a bit short of the 90 minutes that this race goes for so it means that under the safety cars there will be a bit of fuel saving required as well if the drivers are planning to make it to the end of the race with only a single pit stop so that's one of the things that i really like about the format for this series and uh, again it's i think one of the big reasons that speed cafe have jumped on board being fast and being a good driver is not enough. You need to be able to manage the strategy on the run and be able to adapt to circumstances as they change over the course of the race. Absolutely, but I will say that in regards to fuel saving, this is probably one of the better circuits for fuel saving on the entire calendar. It's got a lot of long straights into very large braking zones, and the best way to fuel save, in particular on iRacing, is doing a lift and coast technique. So lifting off before the braking zone, maybe lifting off around the 250 mark before the corner, and then uh, jumping on the brakes. Um, obviously a lot later because you've rolled off and uh, been coasting into the corner, less time on the throttle as well. That's the best way to fuel save, and at Spa, there is a lot of opportunity, opportunity to be doing that. But the cars are beginning to grid up onto the field, so uh, we're about to get our race underway, Lockie. Indeed we are. We just had some really cool shots there out of the back of Fraser Ross's car, but this is how they'll line up. It's Job Stewart on pole position ahead of Jackson, Susan Harlow, Chris Lazarevich and James Scott positions three and four on the grid. Then we go back to Dylan Burke and Ben Holiday. Fantastic effort from the 12-year-old, the youngest driver in the field, to land himself on row three. Aaron Borg, reigning Toyota, reigning six series champion, goes from grid position seven ahead of Louis Paul O'Gallon. Then it's the Kiwi, Jada Ransley out of Night, Jack Boyd completing the top 10. 
John Martin will kick things off from 11th. He's got Zach Hanlon for company on the sixth row of the grid. Andre Heimgartner from 13th with Rhys Cohen and Tyler Howard, your top 15. Tyrone De Silva from 16th with Matt Lapino, Jeff Connell, Robert Crisdale, and Trent Grubel, the top 20. Position 21 will be occupied by Kobe Williams, then it's Ian McMahon out of 22nd, back to Paul Mansell in 23rd, James Foster in position 24 on the grid, Tyler Collins, Daniel Yeaman back to Brady Carr, Kane Thornhill, Jack Cafode, and Jamie Craig, one of our front runners from last week, starting all the way down in position 30. We're going to have to get the rest of the grid cycling through on screen, and uh, we get the pace car already underway, and Lockie. It is a very, very short pace lap here at Spa Francorchamps. The car's already rolling their way into the bus stop chicane. So we are moments away from getting round number two of the Speed Cafe GT3 series underway. And because this is a sports car endurance race, we will be starting on the sports car configuration of the Spa circuit. So that means that they will start not before... Um, what would be turn number one on a source hairpin if it was a Formula One race, but after the hairpin, the run down the hill towards Eau Rouge. And seeing this massive field of GT cars thundering down the hill will be a spectacular start. No, I'm going to be proven wrong here. They are actually going to start on the run into the source hairpin. So the safety car peels off into pit lane. The field lining up in side by side formation. No, I was actually right the first time. They will stay in side-by-side -side formation around the source hairpin, and then it will be up to our pole sitter, Job Stewart, to control the pace of the start. Massive field of GT cars for round number two of the Speed Cafe GT3 8 Series. We are just about to get things underway as the field rolls down the hill. Big, big field of GT cars, and now the field gets the green flag, and it's Job Stewart who pulls the lead ahead of Jackson, Susan, and Harlow. James Scott there tucking into what will be position three ahead of Chris Lazarevich as they head through the high speed flip flop that is Eau Rouge, one of the world's most famous corners. And you can already see the slip streaming on in earnest as they head up to the big braking zone at the end of the Kemmel straight into Lecom. Absolutely, you can see a lot of cars dicing at the moment. Three wide in the background as well. That includes the drivers of Trent Grubel and Matt Lapino as they all try and sort themselves out into Lacoma. Very tricky section that goes from the right to the left and then back to the right again. But so far, so good. I've got to say, just like it was at Indianapolis, the drivers are showing a lot of respect right now. A couple of little bumps in the background. We're looking at Andre Heimgartner side by side at the moment through the brilliant section of corners. We head into no name corner. I think for the most part, the field has sorted themselves out. I can't particularly see any drivers facing the wrong way. So I've got to say, fantastic effort, but I am correcting myself because we do have a spin at pull on. The IKEA car goes around. I think it's Ben Holiday, and he's going to cause a big, big moment contact and a big hit there. And the BMW and the Mercedes absolutely ruined and distraught. Try and see who the Mercedes was, but they will be going almost no much further in this race because that is extensive damage. What a shame for Ben Holliday, the 12-year-old, who'd done a, such a sensational job in qualifying, and we've got a Ferrari that's been turned around as well. I think that might have actually been Dalton Ellery there. We'll wait and pick that up in a couple of seconds' time, but Ben Holliday spinning at the double gauche. Lachlan Murphy is around, and that's caused a big, big incident, and it's still going all the way towards Paul Frey Corner. And this is a disaster. We said it was such a clean start. And it's all gone a little bit backwards now. There's a lot of drivers off the road. Got uh, David Wayne's off the road. Justin Ford, Sam Batty as well. Lockley, Lachlan Murphy was the initial driver to go off as well. So a whole heap of chaos, sadly, in the second part of the lap. Not where we expected it all to kick off. No, we thought that the danger spots would be Eau Rouge and then into Lacombe, but it was actually the middle part of the lap where the carnage started, including at that double gauche corner where Ben Holiday had a spin, yet to determine whether he did that on his own or if he was assisted. But through that really, really high-speed double left-hander, if you come through there and there's a car parked blocking the track, there's not really a lot of options that you've got. Andre Heimgartner and Jeff Connell both did really, really well, actually, to miss that stopped car because it was parked right in the middle of the racetrack. There is Andre Heimgartner at the moment, currently sitting in position number 13, just in behind Tyler Howard. 
James Stewart is your race leader ahead of Jackson Susan Harlow and James Scott is the two Alter C Sports teammates chasing down our championship leader at this stage. It certainly is, and they're doing a very nice job at the moment. Of course, James Scott getting past Chris Lazarevich uh, on the opening lap there. So Chris not having the best start to his race in that Ferrari 488, as we were looking briefly there at the driver of John Martin in the BMW. One of the only BMWs, uh, apart from obviously our race leader currently, Job Stewart, who's doing a very nice job indeed. But uh, John Martin, looking behind him at the moment, has a big wiggle on entry to pull on the BMW, not being too kind to him. And Tyler Howard gets a brilliant run in the Audi R8. And we're in the middle sector right now where the Audi reigns supreme. It looks up inside at Campus Corner, and that was all a little bit too easy. Fairly textbook move there. And uh, John Martin, his maturity and his experience, we know how much racing he has done in sports car championships, not just here in Australia, but right around the world deciding that in these early stages of the race, it's better to give up the position rather than fight to the nail for it. Andre Heimgartner, the next driver who will line up for an attack on the back of John Martin. Now, drivers who were involved in that first lap incident, we know that Ben Holiday was caught up in it, but other drivers back in the pits include Justin Ford, David Shuzo, Julian Andrews, Chun, Lachlan Murphy, as you mentioned, Jared Hughes, Jason Mikowski, Unfortunately, Fraser Ross and Dale Breed, a couple of our professional drivers, both involved in that incident as well. Well, one thing we do need to remember as well, of course, it's a disastrous start to them, but there is a safety car at some point in this race, which will help bunch things together. And for those of you wondering, that's great, but their cars are still damaged. In this series, you do actually get a single spare car to use as well. Think of it as a B car that used to be used in the Formula One series back in the early 2000s, where if you write off your primary, you still get a backup to use as well. So not all hope is lost. Of course, it's a big disadvantage to be caught up in an incident on the opening lap, but your race is definitely not over yet. And let's not forget, too, that with the safety car rules for iRacing, you get a wave around. So if you go down a lap, you will have the opportunity to get back on the lane lap once we get safety cars a bit later on in the race. But how good is this? Great battle for the lead between two of our rising stars of sim racing, Job Stewart and Jackson Susan Harlow, separated by just half a second after the first couple of laps. James Scott in third position. He's no slouch on his team either. Let's not forget, he's currently the championship leader of the V8 Supercars Online Premier Series, which is arguably the pinnacle of sim racing in Australia at the moment. Definitely, James Scott. No slouch whatsoever when it comes to iRacing. But when it comes to GT racing, this is an entirely new experience for him. He's not a driver that really plays with these GT cars all too often. So a lot of learning going on in this race. And I don't expect James, although he's extremely fast, I don't expect him to be a massive contender for tonight's win, purely because tonight is probably going to be a learning experience more than anything for him. But I've got to say, in regards to Altus, Jackson, Susan Harlow putting Job Stewart under a lot more pressure. And I think Job faced all of Indianapolis in round number one. So looks like Jackson Susan Hollow doing a much better job this week of a really keeping that BMW on its toes. So running through the top 10 at the moment, Stewart and Susan and Harlow first and second. James Scott third, then it's Chris Lazarevich in the Ferrari in position four ahead of Louis Paulo Gallon, Zach Hanlon in position six. Oh, as John Martin goes off at the final chicane, big off for John Martin. And uh, has he just managed to pull it up before clouting the wall there or no i think in fact he might have made contact with the tie wall but that bmw did not look like it was going to stop or turn for that final chicane he went firing straight ahead at unabated speed and very lucky not to t-bone one of the cars just ahead absolutely he did end up avoiding the wall as we take a look at the replay on the outside gets squeezed and uh, very violently goes across and like you say, very lucky not to T-bone the uh, Mercedes ahead of Jane Ransley. But uh, does manage to shoot the gap, so to say. And uh, does manage to continue on in his race as well. But uh, not how John Martin would have liked to have started his race in any way, shape or form. As he was doing a great job. But now find himself all the way down in 25th place. And he, like you say, just managed to keep it off the wall, so avoids any damage. One of the things that you really don't want in the early stages of a race like this one is unnecessary panel damage because that obviously creates a 
long pit stop situation and uh, took you a long way down in the order. Now, it was one of the outings that he actually had contact with. I think it was Race Cohen. Tyler Howard was the other Audi R8 that was just ahead, but it was Race Cohen that John Martin had contact with. It was, I think they actually locked wheels as they approached the braking zone for that chicane, and that was why John Martin went off at such high speed. But here is Andre Heimgartner in the Mercedes AMG GT3 sitting in behind those two Audis at the moment. Yeah, we'll see what Andre can do at the moment, doing a great job. And of course, the Audis in front are, in co of course, Tyler Howard and Reese Cohen. And uh, right at the front is Lachlan Murphy as well to make it two orange Mercedes in a single racing queue. But one of them is going to be losing a spot by the looks of it. Jumps on the brakes, so to say, for Tyler Howard to uh, just go past. And I, I have to correct myself. Murphy is actually a lap down, so I've got myself all kinds of bamboozled there so i apologize for that so it is just the two audis in front of andre heitengardner but how much longer will there be two audis so i think it's gonna be one audi very very soon that is very late on the brakes overshoot slightly hurts his mid corner speed and now is under all kinds of attack from reese cohen behind who tried to get a switch back but sadly could not do anything and andre manages to hold that place for now so another spot game there for andre heitengardner that's position 11 for Kelly Brake, because he must take supercars driver. Out in front, Job Stewart just managing the margin back to Jackson Susan Harlow. Sits at eight tenths per second at the moment. Fastest lap of the race for Job Stewart as well. Two minutes 17 0, which actually matches the time that he achieved in qualifying. So tremendous speed in race trim for Job Stewart and uh, Jackson Susan Harlow getting down to a two minute 17 one. So the top two drivers both recording some very rapid lap times in race trim like you say these are two of the best drivers in australian sim racing right now so it's no surprise to see them doing so well at the moment and jackson's still keeping job stewart on his toes right now that bmw did have the gap out to close to a second at the end of uh, lap number three but now jackson has started to get himself into a bit more of a rhythm and of course that audi very, very scary when it comes to low pressure tyres when they're still trying to get up into their correct operating window. And now that the Audi should have those tyres exactly where it needs it, it's looking a lot fast indeed. Sadly, Steve Johnson has run into quite a few troubles uh, throughout today's race and is down in 37th place at the moment. You can see the rear wing looking a little bit not so nice. And now the angle through Lacom is looking a little bit not so nice as well. He holds it steady though, keeps it on the track and it will do well to try and keep Eli Donaldson and Sam Batty behind. Great to have Stephen Johnson in the field, though. And his son, Jet Johnson, has been doing a fair bit of sim racing as well. And in fact, I believe that they are going to team up in a father and son combination for the ARG Esports Cup Enduro on Thursday night. Speaking of fathers and sons in the field, of course, Dolson Ellery is one of the main men behind the organisation of Speed Cafe GC3 Egg Series and his father, Stephen Ellery, former, formerly a very successful privateer in V8 supercars back in the early 2000s. He's running in the field as well, currently scoring in position 36, uh, starting from 53rd on the grid. Yeah, we have had quite a few couple of uh, moves and shakers in this field, which is very cool to see. And uh, some of the biggest, of course, is Oscar Target, currently running in 30th place. Uh, now finds himself up 20 spots, as does uh, Brett, uh, Beric Linton as well, who finds themselves up a whole heap of spots as well as we take a look at Andre Heimgardner on the Motum Simulation replay right now and tries to go for a big dive, and you can see the Audi in front just completely overshoots, goes and sweeps around, is going to get very, very close through that chicane, but Andre, with the traction, gets the job done in the Mercedes-AMG, so brilliant use of uh, capitalising on someone else's mistake there. Yeah, it was an error under pressure, wasn't it, from Tyler Howard heading into the braking zone for the chicane. And Andre Heimgartner is, with his experience, a master of putting the pressure on and then being well-placed to capitalise when that sort of opportunity comes up. So it didn't take much of an invitation for Heimgartner to pounce on that one. And he's now up inside the top 10. Kobe Williams in a few dramas here. Now, he was running in position 13, but... Having been tapped into that spin there by Tyrone De Silva, that's knocked him down to 19th position. So not ideal there. In fact, it's knocked him further back, back to 25th spot. So not an ideal situation there for Kobe Williams, unfortunately. 
nah, the Eclipse in Sports Driver there is uh, going to have to try and make up a little bit more ground now. And that does very quickly find his way back past Ben Blaze there. So uh, only up to 27th now. He's already up on his charge once more. But not how you would have liked to have started your race on lap number 6 of all times. So we see another car. Is that Luis Paul Gallon? It is Luis Paul Gallon, one of your front runners in this series from 5th place, has now dropped the Ferrari 488 GT3. And we'll see where he has done this. It's a campus corner. And a big wiggle through the first right-hander. And it's just continued all the way through to the left-hander there. And it's ended up rotating the Ferrari. That is a shame to see because Luis, one of the most talented drivers in Australian uh, GT racing by far. And uh, it's unlike him to have such a mistake so early in the race. He was filthy with himself for that one, but it was the classic tank slap, wasn't it? The car twitched left, it twitched right, and he tried to catch it once, he tried to catch it twice, he tried to catch it three times, but ultimately he was unsuccessful and ended up spinning off the track. And uh, that has left Louis Polo Gallon down in position 12, so not an ideal situation there. This is a good battle at the moment, and this has been going on for a while now. Aaron Borg and Dylan Burst. Aaron Borg, we know, has had a lot of success in the Toyota 86 series, and we've seen him competing in the Tuesday night Just Send It series on iRacing as well. Dylan Burst has been one of the front runners in the Saturday night Circuit XL A series, and these two Audis have been only about half a car length apart pretty much since the start of the race. No, they've been very, very close, haven't they? And they're doing a great job right now of uh, just sticking with one another and keeping each other honest and uh, working their way around this uh, circuit at the moment. Last lap around, though, they were losing time to Zach Hanlon in front, who has made it three Ultra C Sports cars in the top five. So uh, for Aaron Borg and Dylan Burst, if they want to start challenging that uh, top five, they do need to get a bit of a move on very soon, though. So these are the two leaders, Joe Stewart, Jackson, Susan Harlow, 0.49 of a second, the margin between our leading pursuit, Sim Racing BMW, and our second place, Ulta C Sports, Audi R Race. James Scott is keeping them within range, though. James Scott is 3.1 seconds behind. And James Scott's best lap time, 2 minutes 17.4, not too far away from our race leaders. So... You were talking before, Bo, about the fact that James Scott tends to specialise in the supercars on the iRacing platform rather than the GT cars, but he's adapted really, really well to the GT style of racing so far. He has. He's doing a very good job as well. And, of course, if you can drive a supercar, as some would say in uh, iRacing, you can often drive a lot of things, but James is having all kinds of troubles as Justin Ford, a lapped car, spins in front, and out of nowhere, the commentator's curse in full effect as Chris Lazarevich will steal third place away from James Scott as Justin Ford, with a major error, has deeply affected a race leader there. That was really, really unlucky for James Scott, you have to say, because he did a good job to avoid colliding with that Ferrari that was having its own incident heading into that final chicane. But Chris Lazarevich, he took the opportunistic move and was able to pounce on James Scott, so Chris Lazarevich moves the Ferrari up into third position. He does indeed, but for how much longer, of course, James Scott in that uh, BMW right now with plenty of power in the slipstream, thought about making a move into Lacombs, couldn't quite do it as we're looking on board at the moment with Kobe Williams with a very, very cool webcam set up as well as he works his way around the circuit, but Chris Lazarevich does keep on to the third place for now, so he earned it on uh, lap number seven at the end of lap seven and is trying to hold it for the entire lap eight. But I've got to say right now, just looking at the previous lap times, that James does look like the slightly quicker driver right now to Chris. Has a lot of work on his hands to keep the Ultra C Sports BMW behind. So we are just over 17 minutes into the race. We've got one hour and 13 minutes remaining on the clock. Interesting that we've not seen a safety car yet. One of the trends from the recent Speed Cafe and Carbon Gaming GT3 A-Series rounds is that we have tended to have safety cars quite early in the race, but not the case tonight. We're having a bit more of a green flag run. What would be interesting would be if the safety car was to come out in, say, the next five or ten minutes, because that would be right on the threshold of whether or not you could get through the race from that point with a full tank of fuel, or at least filling the tank up to the fuel capacity that the cars have been restricted to. So you might have a few drivers who will come in under the safety car, 
gamble on trying to make it to the end, but conversely, you might have some drivers who decide that, nope, it's too early. We're going to stay out on the racetrack and we're going to pit a bit later on to make sure that we can definitely get to the chequered flags. So it'll be interesting to see when our safety car, or safety cars, plural, fall tonight. We know that there will be at least one at some stage. And uh, it'll be interesting, like we said at the top of the broadcast, to see what the drivers do in regards to tyre strategy as well. For those of you watching online on speedcafe.com, apologies, just some slight technical difficulties which are being resolved in the background at the moment, but we will keep you informed based on the information that we're getting from our timing feed and uh, from Bo Albert, who's logged into this session on iRacing as well. Absolutely, and we are looking at the battle between James Scott and Chris Lazarevich, which is continuing down the Camel Straight on this particular version on lap number nine. Now, side by side, that will go into the breaking zone, but it's going to have to be the long way around the outside for James Scott. He's going to commit to it. He's going to try it around the outside. He will sweep in a scintillating move, a fantastic effort from James Scott, but Lazarevich sneaks it up inside, tries to get a bit of racing room to get a, that position back, but sadly, nothing forthcoming so the evolution racing team driver will slide back down to fourth but the advantage he still gets from this is that he's now got the slipstream of james scott in front so whilst he was a little bit slower uh earlier in the race compared to the bmw he's now got the slipstream back with him and can use that to his advantage and really capitalize and try and pull away from zach hanlon behind so for chris he's in a better spot now even if he has lost that draft uh has lost that position sorry Good move from James Scott, though, and it goes to show that the outside move heading into a com, it is very much an option. We saw it last night during the Circuit XL A-Series race with the TCR cars as well. Because your able to carry a bit more momentum with the wider line on the outside, but it also puts you on the inside for the next left-hand part of the Lacombe complex, the outside is actually quite a viable way to go there if you want to make an overtaking maneuver work. And James Scott used it to perfection there. However, in that battle, both he and Chris Lazarevich have fallen a bit further back behind our race-leading duo. It's now almost seven seconds between Job Stewart and at third place, James Scott. Yeah, no, it definitely is. But the gap between first and second is a whole lot less. Four tenths of a second that time across the start finish line. So very, very close quarters between, between your race leaders. Job is under a lot of pressure now. And this is the closest that Jackson has been for quite a few laps now. And he is right underneath the rear wing of the Pursuit Sim Racing BMW Z4 GT3. As they work their way through the terrifying Arouge and Radion complex of corners. And Jackson is not quite going to be close enough to get enough of a draft uh, to make any kind of moves down into the Lacombe section. But he is definitely going to be in a much better spot. And actually, you might be about to prove me wrong because he is getting closing very, very quickly. Dives to the inside, potentially for the race lead. He's up the inside. And there's going to be contact between the two. The two make contact, door to door contact. And they are still somehow holding onto the circuit. Suzlin Harlow goes through to the race lead. Immediately has to go defensive into Ravage. Deep on the brakes, they'll both go. And they're both wiggling and squirming away. And I think that Job Stewart and Jackson Suzlin Harlow might have just got away with it. Job has lost the race lead. But I think just then he could have lost so much more. Aggressive and feisty stuff from two of the young guns of the sim racing scene, wasn't it? And it's still very early in the race to be battling that ferociously, you would have to say. The big question is that was fairly robust contacts that those cars made there at Lacombe. Has that done any damage to either one of those cars that could compromise their efforts until they can get to the first pit stop? But it's Jackson, Susan and Harlow who used the slipstream's perfection, and that time it was the inside manoeuvre getting into the com that he was able to make work. Job Stewart didn't want to give up the lead without a fight, and you can bet that he will stay right on the tail of that Audi R8. They're coming up on a couple of back markers as well. They are indeed, and we've already seen in this race how back markers can play an effect in this race, but look at the draft effect that Job Stewart has. He might want to get that race lead back immediately as they fire the way through Blanchmont. You can see, looking to the outside, will he try a very late dive to the inside? No, he's quite content with the outside, actually. And now tries to set up for a big crisscross as they both dive to the pits, but they're both entirely held up by traffic of Dale Breed into the pit lane. So both of them 
want to go in as aggressively as they can to gain advantage on one another, but they can't because the car in front has completely limited what they're able to do. You have uh, the drivers of James Scott and Chris Lazarevich also into the pits. The one outlier here is Zach Hanlon right now, who continues on for another lap. So they're all pitting after, what are we, 23 minutes into the race. Now, based on fuel capacity, they're restricted to not quite their full capacity of fuel. It's 95% up to about 97%, depending on what type of car you're in tonight. And we're seeing now that it's pretty much the whole field coming in. So everybody's out of fuel. That's the only explanation that I have for this at the moment, Bo, is that with the amount of fuel that they've been able to start with, everybody is right on the threshold of the maximum number of laps that they could get out of the tank of fuel. So the big question that you have to ask at this point, can people make it home from here? We've still got 20, uh, one hour and six minutes to go. We're 24 minutes into the race. You would have to say it's looking a little bit tight at the moment, whether or not you can make it to the end of the race, doesn't it? It's a little bit tricky. And uh, with the help of a safety car, that will make things a lot easier, of course. But for the drivers that can go one lap longer right now, which includes the likes of uh, James Foster and Zach Hanlon, they're the two that I can see at the moment. Uh, Kane Thornhill is another driver who's going another lap. They've actually been fuel saving quite aggressively. I've been watching Zach for the last lap or two now, and he has been doing a lot of lifting coasts, which I talked about earlier into the race. He's even doing it into corners you wouldn't often expect. So that should give you an idea of just how tight these drivers are in field. Zach is lifting and coasting throughout the entire infield as well, through Puan all the way up to campus and Fungus. So interesting to see that Job Stewart has not changed tyres, neither has James Scott for that matter. And J uh, Jackson Susan Harlow in the Audi is taking on fresh tyres. So there's a lot of other cars exiting the pits. Jackson Susan Harlow is not one of them. He's going to have fresh tyres on his Ulster Sea Sports Audi R8, but he is going to lose a massive amount of track position in the process. He's tumbled all the way down to 12th position. Jackson Suslin Harlow as a result of the extra stationary time in the pit lane while he put four fresh tyres on that Audi. I would love to back up Jackson Suslin Harlow right now and say that he's going to have a lot of extra grip. Uh, at the end of this race, which is going to be true. But the thing is that so how many times in this series have we seen JSH on the wrong side of a pitch strategy, sadly, and uh, whether it's taking tires or not taking tires, he always seems to be on the other side of the coin to the entire rest of the field. So uh, for Jackson, he's obviously going to be doing the best he can, but right now he is stuck behind Robert Cruzdale, who's not making life easy. And I don't believe Rob has actually found his way uh, into the pits yet. So this is a very, very tricky situation as a Jackson tries to find a way past. And I have to correct myself, Rob has pitted, so he has no incentive to give Jackson, Susan Harlow any kind of easy pass. So just having a look at the stationary times for cars in pit lane. So, Job Stewart, Chris Lazarevich, James Scott, Jaden Ransley, Aaron Borg, Tyler Howard, Rex Cohen, Matt Lupino, and Robert Crisdale. None of those cars took fresh tires. Jackson, Susan Harlow was first of the cars that did change tires. The only other two cars that I can see that have elected to change tyres among the leading contenders at least, Dylan Burse and Andre Heimgarten. And there are a few others a bit further back that have put fresh tyres on as well. And we'll have to wait and see just how much extra grip those new tyres are going to provide. One hour, three minutes and 30 seconds remaining in the race. Still no safety car intervention as of yet. And all of a sudden, it got fascinating, Bo, because now we get the question marks. Will Jackson Susan Harlow's fresh tyre advantage give him enough of a performance boost to catch and pass the cars that have elected not to change tyres? And can people make it to the end of the race based on fuel range from this point, or are they going to have to stop again? It's a very tricky question, isn't it? And we've got some very different strategies going on. You've got drivers who have taken tyres, drivers that haven't taken tyres, and drivers have been able to stretch their stint out for 10 laps, and those that have stretched their stint out over 11 laps as well. And sometimes in this series, that extra lap on fuel can make a big, big difference as we look at James Scott hounding the back of Chris Lazarevich, not for the first time tonight. So a couple of other cars coming in, James Foster and Kane Thornhill, who managed to go an extra lap 
uh, before their pit stop. They've both come in to the pits. So the field has now cleansed itself. Everybody has now done one pit stop. And like you say, that's been a change of position as well. So remember, James Scott got back ahead of... Had a, back ahead of Chris Lazarevich but in the pit stop Lazarevich has jumped back ahead of James Scott so the order now Job Stewart Chris Lazarevich James Scott that's your top three then Zach Hanlon in fourth back to Jada Ransley Arab Ball Tyler Howard Race Cohen in eighth Matt Lapino ninth Jackson Susan Harlow first car on fresh tyres in position number 10 and he is a whopping 26.5 seconds off the lead of the race after electing to put on that fresh set of tyres. I love your work there, Lockie, with the uh, standings of this race currently, but sadly, they've just been messed up. James Scott has found a way past Chris Lazarevich. Once again, a bit of a wiggle there into Campus and Fungias for Chris Lazarevich in the Ferrari, just a little, a little bit wide of the marks there through the chicane, and that was all the invitation that James Scott needed. He found his way past once again, and what we might do is get a Motum simulation replay up on screen. So here's a look at the move and how it happened. And it was just a bit of a wiggle, wasn't it, from Chris Lazarevich? And that was just enough for him to lose a bit of momentum and allow James Scott through. Just like in real life, these GT cars, they do run driver assist. So ABS brakes and traction control, which can be set to varying configurations depending on driver preferences and tyre condition and all of the other variables that you have in a motor race. So uh, that can be one of the things that can be quite handy to make sure that you don't get too much wheel spin on the exit of the corners. And in the case of the ABS, making sure that you don't lock brakes when you are braking deep into corners. One of the big things with GT racing uh, is definitely about trail braking the car correctly. And if you release the brake too suddenly or too aggressively, these cars will snap quite violently very, very quickly indeed. So I think that's what happened to Chris there. Is uh, actually nothing to do with the ABS. It was more just how he released the brake. Coming off it too quickly and the back end just snaps around real quickly. So we're now a third of the way through the race. 30 minutes elapsed, 60 minutes still to go. No safety car interruptions as of yet, and everybody in the field has done one pit stop. The big unknown is will they have to do another pit stop at some stage to get to the end of the race on fuel? We'll start to have a bit of a look at the lap times as well for a point of comparison. And uh, interestingly enough, last time around, Job Stewart, 2 minutes 18.3. Uh, Jackson Susan Harlow, 2 minutes 19 0. So, not really any advantage for Jackson Susan Harlow on fresh tyres as of yet. It will take him a bit of time to get those tyres up to optimum operating pressures and temperatures. Yeah, well, I think they would have just about came up to pressures now. So, I don't think there'll be too much of an issue now for Jackson Susan Harlow. But it's just more a case of this is he actually able to make the pace advantage of new tyres work? And right now, the answer is no. Last time around, it was an 18.4 for Job Stewart, and Jackson Susan Harlow did a 2.19 flat. So that's a big, big difference in pace uh, between himself and Job Stewart right now. Seven tenths of a second, and it's not in the favor of the driver that took tires. So Jackson, obviously the safety car when it comes out, uh, we don't know, and it hasn't came out yet, and we are now one third of the race done. When that does come out, that will obviously uh, be a big advantage for Jackson because he's in immediate proximity. To the other cars they've all got the same warm-up phase so the tires cool down from the safety car period but again he's not really showing the signs that this was the right strategy and once again i've got to say i think strategy might just be costing jackson susan harlow a race in the series and this boat is why we love endurance racing so many variables so many unknowns so many factors and questions and possibilities that don't really get answered or resolve themselves until we get to quite late in the race where hopefully we'll have a flat out sprint to the checkered flag a bit like what we had last week here's a good battle a bit further back that's paul auditore in at position 21 battling it out with daniel yeam and also young oscar target and it's auditore who makes a spot down the inside heading into the source hairpin they're getting very aggressive, aren't they? Paul Auditore looking left, looking right, trying to attack in every way, shape, or form he can. Don't do this, guys. It never goes well. Side by side through Arm Rouge. They make contact. And Paul Auditore, hard and 
into the wall, goes upside down, rolling. He will go, and that is a disastrous way. And the safety car gets deployed immediately. So the safety car will come out to uh, condense this field, and I'm not surprised because that was a very, very scary incident. Goodness gracious me, two cars running side by side, just like you said. I think you and I both simultaneously held our breath there, Bo, because both of us know that running cars side by side through Eau Rouge normally has disastrous consequences. And guess what? It has had disastrous consequences. Massive impact with Wolf, both of those cars, and unsurprisingly, Paul Auditore was heading back to the pits for some repairs. But our the safety car is out on the circuit with 56 minutes and 40 seconds remaining. And, of course, the Speed Cafe, proudly sponsored by networkcafe.com.au. And uh, great to have Network Cafe, which is a network that's been set up by Brett Murray and the team at Speed Cafe to allow businesses within the motorsport industry to promote themselves during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the networkcafe.com.au safety car, which has been driven by Kyle Grek, will shortly be headed out onto the racetrack to take control of the field. It absolutely will. And you can see the uh, safety car is actually just waiting for the leaders at the Kevel Street and will rejoin now. If you are wondering why we're looking at B-roll footage right now, we are just getting a reset sorted out for our broadcast. So hopefully we can return to normal broadcasting images for you guys in the next restart of this race. You're not missing anything, though. We are under safety car number one for round number two of this series. And there is, at the moment, Job Stewart leading this race ahead of provisionally James Scott in second and Chris Lazarevich in third as well. A big shout-out as well to Zach Hanlon right now, who's running in fourth and not looking out of place at all. He's now up eight spots in this race, which is a fantastic charge. But for those of you wondering who might just about be the driver that's moved up the most, but that would go to Matthew Brunt, up a staggering 35 places at the start of this race. I've got to say, that might just be about the most I have seen uh, in this series history. 35 spots is incredible. And uh, in terms of the most positions lost, sadly, it goes to one of our only retirements in this race so far. Luis Paulo Gallon has plummeted 47 spots. If you've just joined us here on speedcafe.com, you are watching round number two of the speedcafe.com GT3 E-Series presented by King Chrome Tools. It's Bo Albert and Lachlan Mansell behind the microphone talking you through all of the action tonight. And King Chrome, who are our major sponsor of this series, they're putting up some very cool prizes for each round of the series and also for the overall highest placed amateur driver in the series standings and tonight's prize for the first of the amateur drivers it's a 2000 kilogram low profile hydraulic garage jack valued at 299 dollars so a trolley jack perfect for the budding race car mechanic going the way of our highest placed amateur driver tonight of course our first placed amateur in the championship standings will take away the very very cool two and a half thousand dollar full toolkit setup. So we look forward to presenting that after the sixth and final round of our series. But right now we are under safety car conditions and in the background we are just working on a couple of technical issues to make sure that we can have a smooth broadcast once we get the racing back underway. If you've just joined us, you've missed the first 30. Four and a half minutes of action. Job Stewart, currently your race leader ahead of James Scott, Chris Lazarevich, Zach Hanlon, back to Jada Ransley, Aaron Ball, Tyler Howard, Reese Cohen, Matt Lapino, and Jackson Suslin Harlow. We've had pit stops for every car in the field. The news from the first round of pit stops was that Jackson Suslin Harlow was one of the few drivers in the field to fit new tyres to his car during that pit stop. He was, and he's going to be rejoining, restarting this race, I should say, quite a long way back compared to a lot of his other drivers that he was fighting. We have, in terms of the drivers in between himself and Job Stewart, we have uh, Beric Linton, Matt Lapino, Reese Cohen, Tyler Howard, Aaron Borg, Jane Ransley, Zach Hanlon, Chris Lazarevich, James Scott, David Huazo, and then your race leader in Job Stewart. So, of course, those two were together on track. In fact, Jackson actually led Job Stewart into the pit lane. Uh, before this safety car period came out. And now, out of nowhere, Jackson is provisionally position number 10, but has some lapsed cars in between him as well. So 
there is a lot of work to do for Jackson to find his way back up towards uh, where he originally should be. But the good thing on his side is this safety car has bunched everyone up. So whilst he still has a lot of cars to pass, the gaps in between them have been condensed. The other interesting thing here, we were questioning the form, weren't we, that with, what was it, about an hour and seven minutes to go when everybody came diving in for that early pit stop about whether or not people would be able to make it to the end based on fuel range. We are now very much at a point of the race where you could make it home if you were to fill the car up with fuel now. However, because it's such a long lap here at Spa, the time that you spend behind the safety car, you can save a fair bit of fuel as well. So the interesting thing for me is going to be, do we see anybody come into the pits to top their cars up with fuel? Or will the drivers be confident that with the fuel that they can conserve behind the safety car, that they'll be right to make it to the end without having to stop again? Well, it's a very interesting question, isn't it? Of course, it is a very, very long lap here at Spa Francorchamps. So in regards to how much fuel you actually need to save to get a lap's worth of fuel, it's quite a lot. But at the same time, under safety car, you're covering a lot of distance as well. So it's a perfect catch-22 of whether or not drivers are actually able to save enough fuel under safety car conditions to uh, give themselves enough of an advantage to uh, maybe not have to stop again during this race. I think it'll be pretty tight myself. I think we'll see a lot of drivers right towards the end of this race really fuel saving to make sure they can get that extra lap or two. It's going to be a fascinating final 50 minutes of this race, that's for sure. Still under safety car conditions, we're watching Jamie Craig in the Lego-sponsored Ferrari, one of the drivers carrying a webcab for us tonight. We saw that he was in the roof of the uh, Porsche vehicle last week. That vehicle has been deemed no longer eligible for this series based on the fact that they couldn't really get its performance levels to be matching the other cars in the field. have just received confirmation from our race control that under safety car conditions, the pit entry will now be open. So any drivers that want to take a little bit extra advantage under this safety car condition can now make a pit stop. And uh, if you were to, of course, make a pit stop now, Lockie, that's a lot of safety in regards to whether or not you can make it to the end of the race. It is. So <laughs> this will be interesting, won't it? Who comes in now under, under this safety car? We'll know the answer to that question very soon because they'll shortly be heading up to the pit lane entry. What would you do in this situation, Bo? It's a hard thing to know, especially without knowing the fuel numbers in these cars right now. If you think there's any chance, though, of making it to the ends uh, without having to uh, dive into the pits under safety car, I would be trying to do that option for sure. Obviously, under safety car, if you make a pit stop, you are going to be losing a whole heap of lap time and uh, track position as well. So you'll be sliding down the order a lot. And that's going to be very, very difficult to uh, make up on track if everyone else can actually uh, make it to the end without needing an extra pit stop themselves. So I, I think if you can make it to the end or you think there's any chance you could, I think it's worth going for the risky strat right now rather than conservative. I tend to agree with you, but... Even if that's the case, there will be some drivers who will feel that, yes, they can get to the end of the race, particularly if we have further safety car interventions. There are a couple of drivers who had to stop a bit earlier on because they had damage, including Matthew Brunt, who, like you said, had gained a lot of positions, but he's been out on the circuit for 14 laps, so you would expect that he would have to come in. Here come the cars now up to the pit entry, and... Zach Hamlin. Zach Hanlon comes in, but Job Stewart stays out, James Scott stays out, Chris Lazarevich stays out. So Zach Hanlon, the first of the cars in the lead pack to come down pit lane. And that's a real surprising one for me, because of course we know the McLaren is quite a thirsty car, but actually Zach was one of the cars that managed to go one lap further than your race leader. So he's done the least amount of laps on a tank of fuel compared to all the other drivers ahead of him at the moment. So for Zach to dive in, that's probably a bit of a worrying question mark in my mind for the rest of the drivers on track who maybe, just maybe, have to uh, do one more pit stop to finish this race. And I want to do a bit of a throwback right now to uh, what happened in the V8 Supercars Online Premier Series at uh, Sebring in Split 2, where Zach was caught up in an incident quite early on in the race. He pitted under safety car and was able to stretch that tank of fuel that he did under the safety car conditions 
all the way to the finish when everyone else had to pit. Zach ended up going from about 35th uh, from that safety car all the way up to winning split two. It's Ross Rizzo, isn't it, who's become renowned for always being able to stretch his fuel range on lap or two further than everybody else. He's not actually in the field tonight, Ross Rizzo, but if he was, you could bet that he would be going for the strategy that would involve stretching the tank as far as possible. Another driver who's come in who was actually quite well positioned strategically, Dylan Burse. So he was running in the top... 13 or 14 and he's come down pit lane for a stop as well there he is now coming back out onto the track i'll tell you what if it turns out that none of the other cars can get home based on fuel range these drivers have just come down pit lane now are going to look very very smart come the end of the race absolutely it's a big advantage if you can actually make it to the end of the race by taking your fuel stop under the safety car of course we don't know just how tight on fuel they'll be but clearly uh, Zach, a very smart driver when it comes to fuel strategy. He's decided to dive on in, as have a couple of others as well. So clearly there must be a little bit of something uh, in regards to making it to the end of this race. Because Justin Ford and uh, Julian Church have also dived in along with Jared Hughes, Steve Johnson, and Steve Ellery. Just to name a couple more as well. So 46 minutes remaining on the clock. At this point, you would imagine that will be set for a race restart this time around. You would have to imagine so. Currently, uh, race control have not said anything particularly, but they like to leave it usually quite late into the lap. So we'll have a look as the leaders uh, do come towards the Blanchimont section of corners in just a few moments' time. I would expect that is when we're going to see the uh, Porsche GT4 car that we're using for this particular series as the safety car. You'll see that pull away, hopefully, and uh, that will then leave control with Job Stewart for, I believe, the third time this season. We've seen a lot of safety cars, and uh, I believe Job Stewart has led every single one so far this season. That's a good point, actually. Job Stewart has led by far and away the most laps of any driver in the series so far. Pretty much the only time that he was not leading the race last week in the opening round was during the pit stop shuffle. And this week as well, he's led a whole bunch of laps and finds himself back in the lead once again. So, the networkcafe.com.au safety car preparing to peel back into pit lane. And we have got 44 and a half minutes. It'll be near enough to 44 minutes exactly remaining on the clock. And it's Job Stewart who's going to be in control of the field ahead of James Scott, Chris Lazarevich. Jada Ransley in fourth, Aaron Borg fifth, then it's Tyler Howard, Reese Cohen, Matt Lupino, Jackson Susan Harlow, and Robert Crisdale completing the top ten. So let's have a look at it. When exactly Job Stewart plans the throttle compared to James Scott behind. It's one of the first times that uh, we've had James Scott actually leading or very, very close to the front for one of these rolling starts. So we'll see how he actually deals with that. And we've got Chris Lazarevich in the very, very fast Ferrari right behind who's willing to attack at any moment that he gets the advantage. But Job Stewart right out of the hairpin, plants the throttle and will lead the restart away. As you can see, it's a brilliant start from Job Stewart. Clears James Scott quite easily. And in fact, the top three are quite spread out. It's uh, Chris Lazarevich that has to be careful of Jane Ransley just behind in fourth place who understands very wide at the top of our Rouge as all the drivers trying to sort themselves out. In fact, Jane Ransley with a slowdown it's going to go plummeting down the order now. It's a shame for him. As a, I'm wondering if we're getting something happening here. Because we're seeing drivers not willing to pass. We'll wait and see what happens there. But uh, yeah, Jada Ransley, the worst time that you can cop a slowdown is immediately after a safety car restart. And we've got James Foster off the road and in the fence at the top of Eau Rouge. He was running down the order anyway doesn't look like it was quite as massive a shunt as what we saw for Paul Auditore, which was the reason that we had the safety car in the first place. And James Foster's got it all wrong on his own. Whack into the wall. Spins back across the track and thankfully does not get collected by any of the other approaching traffic. No, very lucky for him to uh, get away with that, in fact. But, yep, we are still indeed racing. So, clearly, uh, Aaron Borg just a little bit confused there and didn't decide to pass... Jane Ransley there at all, perhaps a little bit of an agreement between the two to make sure 
they're not wasting uh, time fighting one another. But James Scott now, we're on board with him as he tries to keep an eye on Job Stewart in front. He's doing a great job through this middle sector of pulling away from the old esports car. So for the uh, Pursuit Sim Racing youngster, doing a very nice job indeed. Chris Lazarevich in third has fallen just a little bit back and then a very large gap back to the likes of Ransley. But Borg is under all kinds of pressure from a driver we have seen all too much in this series. Jackson, Susan Harlow. They're going to go side by side into Blanchemont. That's going to be Jackson hitting the curb and going right in front of the Baron Borg. Very, very close. And Tyler Howard thought about getting involved in the fight as well. A very, very close gaggle of cars right there as they all try and sort themselves out. But Jackson, Susan Harlow will come out on top. Tyler Howard is not going to come out on top. He's been passed by Reese Cohen into the bus stop chicane. And Reese should just about be able to close the overlap into the La Source here. People will see. No, he's not able to. And Tyler Howard dives it back up the inside and makes move stick as they apex at La Source. Excellent opening lap after the race start for Jackson Susan and Harlow. He's already up to fifth position. He was in ninth spot at the race start. So he's gained four spots in the space of one lap. And the good news for him is that he's now got the margin to the race leader down to just over six seconds. So Jackson, Susan and Harlow, who will now have a bit of clear track to work with, can start maximising the advantage of the fresh tyres on the Altus Esports Audi and hunting down the cars ahead of him. We'll see what he can do. His next target will be Jane Ransley. And there's not too much of a gap there for Jackson to hunt down until he gets to the back of that Racing Sims New Zealand uh, Mercedes AMG, but then there's a quite a large gap back up to your top three. We're staying very, very close at the moment. We're still looking at seventh place. Uh, Tyler Howard at the moment, who made that move, of course, on Reese Cohen into a source, which is a great move. But there's a big train of Audis here, so clearly the Audis, one of the best suited cars around this circuit. Indeed, they are, but like you say, it's a big freight train of them at the moment. <laughs> Born, Howard, Cohen, Lupino, Jack Boyd, Robert. Dale and also Brady Carr in that very distinctively painted Bostic Audi R8 who's just holding out Andre Heimgartner at the moment. Looking a bit further back in the pack is Ben Dahlia who we've seen competing in the Australian Formula Ford Championship currently battling it out with Ben Blaze and they're squabbling over positions 18 and 19. Trent Grubel as well in the number 74 Ferrari. Another driver with experience in the Toyota 86 series. Here he's on screen at the moment. He's squabbling for position with those cars as well. He's indeed, obviously, the Ferrari and the uh, Audi behind. Very different strengths and weaknesses between the two of them. But at the moment, Benjamin De Alia not able to find any way past Trent Grubel, who uh, works his way through Blanche One. A very scary corner in the Ferrari, actually. It's, it always feels like it's going to step out on you at very high speed. But we go back up front to Jackson, who's in Harlow, has found his way back to the Racing Sims New Zealand Mercedes very, very quickly indeed. We'll see what he can do. Obviously, the best chance at an overtake here is to not go for a move at La Source. You want to just hang back a little bit and build that draft all the way up through Rouge and then in down the Kemmel Street and into the uh, Lacombe section. The issue for Jackson is just being too close to the car in front when you're going up through Rouge because you can kill your exit quite easily and end up not having the draft effect or the overspeed to get the overlap on the car in front, but Jackson has done just fine, and will look to the outside on the Mercedes AMG, side by side, down the camel they will go, the overlap is with Jackson, Susan Harlow, and Jane Ransley puts up the white flag, he's having none of that. That was too easy for Jackson, Susan and Harlow, we had the move done before they even got into the braking zone for Lacombe, so Jackson, Susan and Harlow up to fourth position, and he's got pace to burn in that Altus Esports Audi at the moment, Gets up to position number four, and now he's got a lot of fresh air ahead. It's almost another five seconds up the road to Chris Lazarevich sitting in at position three. So now we'll get an idea of just how fast that Audi R8 could go on its fresh set of tyres. Just having a look down the timing screen as well at the cars that came in for that second pit stop a few laps ago. The highest placed of those at the moment is Lachlan Murphy, who sits in position 26 just ahead of Jamie Craig. Other cars that came in for a second pit stop include Kobe Williams and Jack Defoe, but Zach Nicol uh, lost a fair bit of time with his uh, second pit stop, and Dylan Burst as well. I reckon he must have had an incident after the safety car because he and, uh, and Zach Hanlon have both dropped a fair way down the order bar. 
I'll just go back and have a look at their lap times to actually see if they have had any kind of issues. In fact, it was slow lap 19s for both drivers, so clearly some kind of issue. In fact, I've just had a look at Zach Hanlon. He has had a lose all by himself at Ar Rouge and was very, very lucky to get away with a no kind of a... Well, he had a little bit of damage, but it could have been oh so much worse. So that is why Zach Hanlon has fallen a long way down the leaderboard. And we'll try and see what had happened to the other Ferrari there as well. But we're looking at Steve Johnson with a massive impact at Pool on Corner. And everybody having to take an avoiding action there. One of the Audis getting tripped over into a very large spin as well. That was Julian Church. So a uh, very, very dramatic incident there. And we're going to look at it from another point of view of Julian Andrews Church. Who comes around Pool on Corner. And out of nowhere just sees a Mercedes right there in the middle of the track. And he goes spinning in sympathy. And Dylan Burst was also involved in that one as well. A bit earlier on, he made contact with Stephen Johnson's Mercedes too. So Dylan Burst, another one of the drivers on the two-stop strategy who unfortunately has been caught up in an incident. And the thing there is that uh, those two stoppers, while they might have been a bit more confident about their abilities to get to the end based on fuel range, making that second pit stop, it left them absolutely buried in the field. And you, when you are down the order, it heightens the risk because it leaves you exposed to having contact or getting caught up in incidents with slow cars. And unfortunately for Dylan Burst, that's exactly what has happened. It has indeed, and that's a disaster there because Dylan was doing a very good job indeed. And uh, I was looking forward to where exactly he could have finished in today's race. But sadly, uh, round two isn't going to be too nice to him. And he's going to have to try and uh, find something out. Uh, for the uh, rest of the season to try and get a good result out of. So, Jackson Suzlin Harlow was the fastest driver on the racetrack last time around, 2 minutes 18.1. However, he was only a couple of tenths quicker than Job Stewart. So, he's got 35 and a half minutes to try and make up the remaining six and a half seconds to the race leader, Job Stewart. There will be a couple of cars in the form of James Scott and Chris Lazarevich that he's going to have to try and pass as well. Yeah, so we'll see what Jackson Susan and Harlow can do when it comes to passing other cars when he does get there, or if he does get there. But uh, so far, he has proved that overtaking isn't too difficult for him. He's made some brilliant passes already in this race after being dropped down quite a far way after that opening pit stop. But Chris Lazarevich is also closing in on the back at the moment of James Scott, who has just been uh, losing a bit of time recently. Last lap around, lost three tenths of a second to the Ferrari behind. And now Chris is in striking distance just about as they uh, will begin to head their way through Art Rouge and Radion, and then onto the Kemmel straight as well. So maybe Chris Lazarevich can make something happen on the Altus Esports uh, BMW in front and get himself up the leaderboard and maybe challenging Job Stewart later on. Robert Crisdale into the pits as well, which is interesting. So I'm not sure if that's a scheduled pit stop or if they had damage, but they pits out of what was a position inside the top 10 and uh, that will be that car's second pit stop of the race he'd been out there for uh, just over 12 laps so pretty much on the same strategy as all of our race leaders so we are getting very very close to the 30 minutes left in this race mark so the almost two-thirds race distance has been completed so fuel strategy will start becoming very interesting indeed as uh, we do have Tyler Collins actually off the road at Le Common. We'll have a look at what exactly has happened there. He's done it all by himself in the Mercedes AMG and it's a very slow speed spin. You won't find all too much damage there on his uh, Swift Tech car. But sadly for Tyler, who we're looking at with one of our uh, webcams on broadcast right now, sadly, that's not how he would have liked lap 22 to go for it. No, and you can see the frustration in his face at the moment on the webcam as well you know, after that incident, so obviously not ideal there. This double left-hand section just after two on, and it's described as double gauche. Uh, gauche, of course, being French for left. It's been a bit of an action zone so far in this race. We saw some dramas there on the first lap for young Ben Holiday. We saw Stephen Johnson having an incident there as well. Well, oh no, John Martin's made contact with the back of Brady Carr's car as well. And the Bostick Audi goes spinning off the circuit. Cam McDougall involved in that one as well. 
Yeah, a lot of cards involved in that one, sadly. And you can see it was just the initial contact that caused a big check up in the middle of pull on. So, not ideal for any of the drivers involved. But, but thankfully, it looks like other than those four drivers that were involved, uh, it didn't collect any more unnecessarily. We have seen a few incidents tonight where uh, perhaps more cars could have been avoided uh, from getting involved in the incident and sadly weren't. But in that incident, everyone held their brakes, no one rejoined unsafely. And that was a good thing to see. Looking at Jamie Craig in the Lego Ferrari on screen at the moment. And he's currently just behind Lachlan Murphy. And Murphy and Craig, they're the two highest placed cars that have come in for a second pit stop. So, in terms of fuel, they're both about four laps better off than the cars that are ahead of them at the moment. They are, so we'll see what happens through our region. It's actually a bit of a slow exit there from Jamie Craig. You won't be all too happy about that. He's actually put himself under pressure now, potentially, from Tyler Collins behind. But uh, for Jamie Craig, he should be safe for at least this lap as a Tyler Collins for that pretty extensive rear wing damage now after a couple of incidents in this race. We'll have to keep on fighting. Ryan Healy putting a lot of pressure on the back of uh, Sam Batty at the moment, who uh, very aggressively defends his position right now. P17 for the BMW Z4 driver. If we go back to look at Kobe Williams, who's doing a good job in that Mercedes AMG for Eclipse in sports. And uh, of course, he could have been could have been so much more in this race, but uh, unbelievably, it's uh, fallen a little bit wayward for him. But Kobe Williams, another driver on a pretty good strategy because he is about six laps better off on the fuel compared to our race-leading cars. So he's a driver who will definitely not be fuel compromised in any way, shape or form. And he has a view there of Ferrari going spinning off at double gauche. That was Eli Donaldson having a moment in that section of the racetrack. Yeah, unfortunate for Eli. We'll uh, probably get a replay up on screen and have a look exactly what has happened there. Is it a battle though? with the driver of King Thornhill and sadly just releasing the brake a little bit too early on turning and he's, the Ferrari's just done a very slow snap over at the moment and see there it just rotates slowly 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 and it finally lets go but it was all too late and nothing the second Eli left off that brake there was nothing he could do to bring that car back sadly the other thing that's happening at the moment is that Jackson Suslin Harlow in position four is absolutely flying two minutes 17.7 on the previous lap, 2 minutes 17.9 on the most recent lap, and he is taking time out of the cars ahead of him by quite substantial chunks at this stage. So the new tyres for Jackson Suslin Harlow starting to provide the advantage that he was looking for. We ride on board with Andre Heimgartner as he heads down into Eau Rouge. And he's another driver who put new tyres on at his pit stop, and he's worked his way back up into position 11, Andre Heimgartner, who, let's not forget, is inside the top three in the championship after finishing on the podium last week in Indianapolis. Now, Andre definitely in a very good spot in the championship after one round, but of course, it's a long series for this driver. So uh, 11th place right now isn't the best result for him, and you can bet that he'll be looking forward to try and get a little bit more out of uh, championship point standings-wise. But uh, just back to Jackson, Susan Mahalo. Last lap round, of course, four tenths of a second faster. The gap right now at the start of the lap to Job Stewart was 5.2 seconds. If he takes four tenths of a second out for the remaining 13 laps in this race, that works out exactly to 5.2 seconds. <laughs> However, there are a few complications, of course. And the most obvious complication, in the words of Murray Walker, is that catching is one thing, but passing is another thing altogether. And we know that not only James Stewart, but also James Scott and Chris Lazarevich are not going to just let Jackson Susan Harlow drive past. They are going to make a fight out of it. So even though Jackson Susan Harlow is a fair bit quicker than James Stewart at the moment, he will have to still have some cars that he will have to be able to negotiate his way around. He will, but the good thing about Spa is that there's actually some extremely long straights where potentially, if you really know your exit, you can get past the car in front before you even get into the braking zone, thus not even compromising your racing line and getting a speed boost technically down the straights as well with the slipstream effect. And uh, so that could potentially play into Jackson Susan Harlow's hands when it comes to passing Chris uh, Lazarevich as well. But also, don't forget that James Scott in third, or sorry, uh, second place right now, is a teammate to Jackson Susan Harlow as well. And I can tell you from experience, Ultras doesn't do any kind of team orders, 
but we do race each other very cleanly and fair, so you can bet that James Scott will not make life too difficult. So I think the only cork in the bottle really for Jackson, Susan and Harlow is A, his own pace, and B, passing crits. Checking out this pack of cars, so this is uh, just behind Lachlan Murphy, and big, here we go, down the inside, that's Jamie Craig gaining what will be 18th position away from Lachlan Murphy. So Jamie Craig now moves up to be the best of the cars on the two pit stop strategy. But this is an 11-car battle, this one. It stretches from Jamie Craig in 18th all the way down to Paul Manson in 28th position. So they might not be battling for the lead. They might not even be inside the top 10. But these cars all battling ferociously for a position either just inside or, in a lot of cases, outside the top 20. As we see Lachlan Murphy back around the outside of Jamie Craig, but he gets muscle wide for his troubles, Lachlan Murphy. And he'll lose another spot as a result of that one with, um, it looks like, Kobe Williams, Michael Gurry, and also Tyler Collins all going through. You can see there that one little mistake there, sadly, for Lockie Murphy, and he's been passed by a whole bunch of different cars there, unfortunately. So one little mistake in a pack like this as Kane Thornhill is going to get spun around. And sadly, it hasn't been the Ferrari's day here at Spa. How many Ferraris have we sadly seen tapped into a spin? But it's going to continue to pull on corner. Paul Mansell side by side, and it's going to get nudged out just by Daniel Yeaman, who makes that move stick as well. So some very feisty battling, even if there is uh, such a long pack here. Great stuff there. Unfortunately, it ended in a bit of contact, but we kind of suspected that that was on the cards with the freight train of cars that were forming up. Here is the look out the back of James Scott's BMW. Chris Lazarevich is there, and so too is Jackson Suslin Harlow, who continues to fly up to the back of the race leaders. Two minutes, 17.8 for Jackson Suslin Harlow on the previous lap. He was seven tenths per second quicker than Scott and Lazarevich. He was an entire second quicker than our race leader, Job Stewart. And he was just in cruise control at the front of the field at the moment. He won't want to be in cruise control for too long, though, Job Stewart, because Jackson Suslin Harlow on fresh tyres is coming and coming fast. Hey, he is. Last lap around 17.8 was uh, Jackson Susan Harlow's lap time. And we said if he could keep taking four tenths a lap out of Job Stewart, he would get there by the end of the race. Well, forget that, he's taken a second out and James Scott is now trying to defend uh, that second place very aggressively against Chris Lazarevich. So uh, Chris is putting up a big fight because he can see what's coming in the mirror and it's not a very happy Altus driver. And he is out for blood. He wants revenge after losing so much time in that pit stop and being so far back. There's 25 minutes left in this race and there's a big question mark over fuel for all of these drivers. But in regards to pace, well, there's only one answer, and it's that Jackson Susan Harlow definitely has it. He's the driver with an abundance of speed heading into the closing stages of this race. And the other thing that we know is that the drivers that are on older tyres, they'll reach the cliff and they'll start to fall away quite rapidly once they get to a certain point. And then Jackson Susan Harlow's advantage is only going to become even greater. So it's going to be hard work for these drivers to hold on in what is now 24 minutes that we've got remaining in the race. And if they are fuel compromised, and if they do have to start conserving and lifting and coasting, that'll be the other thing that'll play on their minds as well. So a lot for these drivers to think about at the moment. There definitely is, of course. They're trying to battle with one another. They're fighting for every bit of lap time they can on track, but at the same time, trying to do a little bit of uh, mental arithmetic in their head as well. So it's uh, not an easy task in any way, shape, or form. But uh, for these drivers right now, there is 10 laps to go. And I'm um, just thinking about it in my head right now. I've got to say, I don't know if they can make it on fuel. I think it's going to be extremely tight, but I would be leaning towards the drivers having to take one more pit stop in this race. So if that happens, and if we do see drivers coming in for an extra pit stop, then Jamie Craig, who is the highest placed of the drivers to be on that two-stop strategy, and is, what is he, four laps better off? Yes, he's got four laps of extra fuel compared to the cars ahead. 
he could be in quite a good position. He's 37.5 seconds off the lead of the race at the oh, moment. I'm going to cross you here, sorry, for a minute, because Chris Lazarevich has just been turned around by James Scott. So contact between the two. You could see it getting close and close down the Kimmel straight, but sadly, Chris just tried to turn in a little bit too early, I think, and has turned across the nose of James Scott there. We'll need another look. I'll get your opinion as well, Lockie, but for me, I think Chris Lazarevich may be just trying to turn in a little too early there when the car starts overlap. The other significant thing about that incident is the fact that Jackson Suzlin Harlow has basically been handed two free positions. He has now passed both of those cars and has a clear shot at Job Stewart. But let's have a look at what happened as they headed into the braking zone. So he moved across to the inside to try and defend the position. James Scott, the onus is on Chris Lazarevich to get the position freely. And because James Scott lost some momentum there on the exit of that corner, in fact, James Scott's just pulled over and let Jackson Suzlin Harlow go through. So James Scott decided not to fight for that position. Chris Lazarevich has stayed in position number four, but of course he has lost a lot of time to the race leaders. So here we go. We are going to be looking at around nine laps remaining in this race as we get one final slow-mo look of sadly where Chris Lazarevich's chances for provisionally of a podium finish have sadly gone in a rotation of uh, nowhere for him. But uh, Jackson Susan Harlow, nine laps to go and only two seconds to close on Job Stewart in front. Surely this race is on now. Yeah, and you know what? I'd be backing Jackson Susan and Harlow for the win from here. I think that with fresh tyres and the pace advantage and the fact that we've seen that it is reasonably straightforward to make overtaking manoeuvres. Oh, as we see J Jada Ransom getting elbowed wide by Tyler Howard on the exit of the final chicane. But to complete the point, I think that Jackson Susan and Harlow is in a pretty stout position the way things stand at the moment. We saw a very aggressive pass there just for a moment. And uh, in fact, we just had Sam Batty off the road as well. I believe he might have actually just had a crash at Ar Rouge. So uh, uh, plenty of drivers actually struggling quite a lot. In fact, Sam Batty has crashed all by himself uh, exiting pit lane. So he's decided he can't make it on fuel and has dived into the pits. In fact, a lot more cars are slowly diving into the pits. I just saw another driver there uh, who was also in. So a lot of drivers are beginning to think they cannot make it on uh, fuel as I'm seeing a big moment here as Jane Ransley almost three wide down the back straight as they dive their way into the con, but it's also side by side into Arouge, Kobe Williams and Lockie Murphy. We saw it go wrong once, it's going to go wrong twice. The answer is yes, it will. And Lockie Murphy has to cut the corner completely to avoid a bigger incident there. And that could have been so much worse than we saw earlier in the race. Daniel Yeaman now with a brilliant run after everyone else was checking up. Finds his way past Paul Mantle. Contact in a straight line. And Yeaman goes hard into the wall in a straight line. Reminiscent of Lewis Hamilton in 2011. A big hit there for the Audi. And he's left facing the wrong direction on the Kenmore straight. What a horrible feeling that must be. So... It was Lachlan Murphy who ran wide. That was what caused everybody to get checked up. And Daniel Yeaman, he comes up alongside the number five BMW of Paul Mansell. Was it Mansell that he had contact with? Yes, it was. So, no tail contact before they got to the braking zone. And it's Yeaman who's gone hard into the Arbco on the left-hand side. And that will be his day done. A very, very big hit there, sadly, for Daniel Yeaman, but uh, he will try and continue in the race. Obviously, the damage, uh, thankfully, wasn't as severe as it could have been. He has been affected by it, but he will still be able to finish the remaining 18 and a half minutes left in this race. We have a look at what is going on for our race leaders at that time around an 18-7 for Job Stewart, but some four tenths quicker was still Jackson, Susan Harlow. The gap down to 1.5 seconds. We're closing up every single second as well. We look at Tyler Howard and look backwards to the driver behind of Reese Cohen and Jane Ransley as they try and sort themselves out. And watch carefully for this Mercedes down the back straight or down the Kimball straight. Has plenty of grunt and maybe can get a little bit closer to the back of Tyler Howard despite the large gap between them currently. So one of the things that I'm looking at as well here is just... Um pit lane transit time versus stationary time so when you subtract the stationary time from the total amount of time that cars have spent in pit lane it looks like it's about 60 seconds to transit pit lane and 
and take a pit stop. So if you had to stop and you had to put in, say, five seconds of fuel to get to the end um, as a splash and dash, you'd probably be transiting pit lane for about 65 seconds. At the moment, the highest place of the cars on the two-stop strategy that we talked about is Jamie Craig. He's 41 seconds off the lead of the motor race. So you do the maths there, Bo. And uh, if that happens, if the drivers in the lead pack do have to stop again for a splash of fuel, they're probably going to come out behind the drivers who are on that two-stop strategy. And wouldn't that be a headline? The driver that's currently in 17th place could, with just a couple of minutes left in this race, we're looking at 15 minutes remaining, could potentially be on course to win the race if everyone else is unable to make it to the finish. We're looking at Jackson, Susan Harlow just quickly under a second now to your race leader. He's got the pace right now. Well, who exactly has the advantage? As we can see, Matt Lapino, is he out of fuel? That was a, he might have had a spin actually. Sorry, my apologies, but we'll get a modem simulation replay up on screen and see what exactly has happened to the 112 car. It's gonna be through the funniest section of corners. And in fact, I've just had a look on my end as well, and you're about to see a typical story of the Audi. He'll turn it into the left here, a big snap, tries to correct, overcorrects, and the Audi meets Armco. And that's going to be damage for Matt Lapino, and quite possibly another visit to the pits for him as well. So he was running in the top 10 at the time, and oh no, Jaden Ransley's gone around. That's in the final chicane. He'd been battling very hard with that trio of Audis, hadn't he? But he's finally been nerfed into a spin there, Jaden Ransley, and he falls back to 10th position as we see that Andre Heimgarten has now moved up into 7th position. He's one of the other drivers, of course, who is on a fresher set of tyres as we take a look at what happens to Jaden Ransley heading into the final chicane. Andre Heimgarten down the inside, though, with three wide. That was uh, Aaron Borg was the car that was in the middle, and that was just a case there of three into one do not go. Absolutely. How many times have we seen a similar incident to that where three drivers stamping on the brakes into the bus stop chicane? It often ends in tears, and once again, sadly, we have another prime example of that as uh, many drivers end up facing the wrong way and a lot of chaos uh, for the drivers involved. But looking at Jackson, Susan, Hollow now, the gap is down to just five tenths of a second and closing every single uh, corner just about as well as he really does have the pace advantage but what are the drivers doing on strategy because i believe these drivers are going to be very very tight on fuel indeed but jackson now has the potential to sit behind and just save a little bit more fuel here as well so does jackson elect to just pass joe Stewart as big as, as fast and early as he can and try and build that margin or does he sit behind and just maybe, just maybe, squeeze himself with enough fuel to get to the end. That might be the smart thing to do. Sit in the slick stream, conserve fuel. And if that's the difference between having to stop for a splash and dash or not, that could be enough, couldn't it? So we'll wait and see what Jackson Susan Harlow does. Full thumbs up, though, to James Scott. For somebody not that familiar with the GT cars, and has been an exemplary performance from the Alta C Sports driver. He continues to sit in position three at the moment. Chris Lazarevich, despite that spin, and Lacom still there in fourth position at this stage, ahead of Tyler Howard, Race Cohen in sixth. Andre Heimgartner, as mentioned, now up to seventh position ahead of Jack Boyd, Aaron Borg, and Jaden Ransley, despite that incident at the final chicane, maintains his position inside the top ten. Here's Jamie Craig, who's worked his way up into 17th position and is currently sitting in behind Tyler Collins. So, we'll see how exactly that battle does pan out, but I'm just noticing that Jane Ransley has dived into the pit. So, Jane Ransley, one of the first drivers to think that they are not able to make it to the end, especially of your leading front pack. So, Jane, we'll see what he does in regards to uh, fuel and uh, see just how long of a stop it is, and then we can work out how that works in relation to the drivers like Tyler Collins and Jamie Craig, who we were just mentioning there, who are obviously a little bit better off on fuel than some of our other drivers. So Jamie Craig, definitely in the catbird seat, so to say, in regards to making it to the end of this race on a single tank of fuel. And Jackson Simpson Harlow up front as well, not getting too aggressive with Job Stewart, so maybe he is fuel saving a little bit, just to see if he can stretch the fuel a little bit longer. Trent Gru uh, Grubel at the moment 
who we looked at briefly in, in 10th place. He has to be very careful. Benjamin D'Alia and John Martin very close behind. And John Martin, a very fast driver and very, very talented. Wouldn't want him behind me in the closing stages of an endurance race. It's such a long pit lane here at Spa because you have to go through the two separate parts of pit lane. You go through both the Formula One section and then the sport car section so Jaden Ransley was only stationary in his pit box for 4.4 seconds during the stop but his total time in pit lane was over a minute so it was only a, a splash and dash for Jaden Ransley and he has rejoined the race all the way down in at 28th position after that stop. So a bit of flame cam out the back of the Zach Hanlon McLaren, one of our favourite camera shots here on iRacing. Uh, no flame, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so does the fact that Jaden Ransley is coming for that splash and dash, does that add weight to our theory that there's going to be other cars that are going to be fuel compromised as well? And then we could Lucky. be seeing a flurry of pit stops here. <laughs> Have you seen the lap times the leaders are doing right now? So, Joe Stewart just did a 2 minute 21.9. Jackson Susan and Harlow a 2.21.6. James Scott a 2.20.2. Chris Lazarevich still on it, 2 minutes 18.6. But all of our top three drivers were considerably slower than the pace that we know that those cars are capable of. And here comes Jackson Susan and Harlow. Thinks about attacking for the lead, but then decides not to. He doesn't want to be at the front. He wants to be sitting in the slipstream and not using his maximum amount of fuel at the moment. So I've been watching these drivers for the last few moments. That's why I've been a little bit quiet on the disc, on the uh, commentary front. But these drivers have been lifting and coasting like you absolutely would not believe. We're talking 200 to 300 meters before every braking zone. They have slowed down right immediately. So the gap between James Scott and Jackson Susan Harlow just three laps ago was close to four and a half seconds. That is now absolutely nothing. They've lift off well before the curbing here at uh, Puan Corner as well. These drivers are on absolute maximum fuel save. And what they're doing right now is allowing the drivers like Chris Lazarevich to hunt them down by the margin of four to five seconds a lap. We still have at least five laps remaining in this race. That, of course, equals 25 to potentially more seconds, perhaps the 30 to 35 second region of uh, time locks that they're currently doing with these laps. So for these drivers, if they don't get a move on soon, if there is anybody who has been fuel saving since the start of this stint, they may be in the position to win this race. Well, Chris Lazarevich has not backed off whatsoever. He's going about three seconds more quickly than the race leaders at the moment and he'll be right back up with them before you know it but Chris Lazarevich stopped on the same lap as Stuart, Susan and Harlow and Scott so oh, we've got a big crash for Ben Dahlia coming down into the double gauche sequence of corners and that's a shame for Ben Dahlia because he was running inside the top 15 at the time but Chris Lazarevich is taking massive chunks of time out of the race leaders. There he is. You can see him there at the back of the shot behind Joe Stewart, Jackson, Susan Harlow and James Scott who are going to be on an, an economy run to try and get to the end of this race without having to stop again. Because again, coming back to the point that I made a couple of laps ago about the length of pit lane, because it is such a long pit lane, you are better off losing three seconds a lap than coming in for a splash and dash simply because of the amount of time that it will take you to transit pit lane. Well, they're not losing three seconds a lap anymore. They're losing eight seconds a lap. Last time around, race leader 225, fastest lap of the race was a 217. They have slowed down so much at the moment that anybody who is even slightly comfortable to make it to the end of the race is going to win. The pace they're doing is not enough. And if they continue to just drop the pace more and more each lap, eventually it's going to get to the point where if any of these drivers had have pitted earlier and actually dove in, taken the field, done the pit lane transit time, they could have still potentially come out on top. 
So Jamie Craig, who was 45 seconds off the lead a couple of laps ago, is now only 38 seconds off the lead, and he was five seconds quicker than our race leaders last time around. And we know that Jamie Craig and also Michael Gurry, they are four laps better off on fuel than the leaders. Here they are on screen at the moment, with Jamie Craig tucked up behind Tyler Collins. Tyler Collins, a driver that you would expect would have to save fuel as well as Jamie Craig goes for the move down the inside into Ravage. And that will be Jamie Craig moving up into 14th position. So Jamie Craig, the Lego Ferrari, potentially in a really, really strong strategic position at the moment. Of course, those that do know, I'm a part of Alters Esports myself, and I've had a little bit of a look at Jackson Susan Harlow's telemetry as he goes for the race leader, Blanchemont, I uh, think's about it up the inside of Job Stewart, very, very close between the two there. But we are looking at about a lap and a half less fuel for these drivers that they need to make it to the end of the race. So they need to be saving maximum, and that's why you're seeing the lap times drop off as much as you are. So about a lap and a half short on fuel are mm -hmm. this time around. It will be a 222.6 that picks the pace up ever so slightly, but they're still losing close to four to five seconds a lap to anyone still running at full tilt. So it's an economy run at the moment. That's basically what it boils down to at this point. So we'll have a look at what the lap times are this time around. They were in the 225s last time through. It's a little bit quicker this time. 222.6 for Job Stewart and for Jackson Susan Harlow, and for James Scott. Jack Boyd, who's in position five at the moment, actually was the fastest driver in our top 10 at the moment with the two minute 18.6s. So we've got our leaders running side by side, getting into the breaking zone at the top of the hill for Lacombe. And Chris Lazarevich has made the move through on James Scott as well. So Chris Lazarevich up into third position. He's the man with all the pace at the moment. And look at Susan Harlow's weaving around and putting the pressure on the back of Job Stewart. This is such a tough position at the moment. You want to lead or you want to be second in the slipstream. And it's a hard thing to do to save fuel without giving away track position. And Job Stewart is having to juggle both of those objectives at the moment. I also think it's just a little bit of mind games from Jackson Susan Harlow. You saw him talking there on the webcam. He's just a little bit content right now talking to his teammates about what he's trying to do. I think it's just more mind games than anything. You saw him weaving behind the back of the Pursuit Sim Racing BMW into Ravage, but he actually had no intentions of really passing. He had the chance to get an overlap and he hit the brakes well and truly before he got to the corner because he didn't want to make that move stick. So I think Job's not under too much pressure right now apart from serving the amount of fuel that he needs to finish this race. I think for Jackson, it's more about mind games and just putting Job under pressure so that he's not saving as much fuel as he can. He's not running the optimal lines and he's not running the shortest line around the circuit, therefore burning more fuel. So I think that's what Jackson's trying to do more than anything right now. And we just saw Jamie Craig off the road as well. And with that excursion for Jamie Craig, he's actually just given up a lot of time. So his chances of catching these race leaders, even though they are in fuel-saving mode, took a severe battering with that excursion. And it's now Paul Mansell in 14th position in the number 5 BMW, who is the highest placed of the drivers, who we know is right to run at maximum pace through to the finish. Jackson, Susan Harlow, really, really good run out of the source hairpin. He will go side by side with Job Stewart on the run down into our Rouge. But again, it's Job Stewart who just holds out the Altus Esports Audi. What a finish we've got here with four minutes and 10 seconds remaining. It's about track position. It's about fuel conservation. It's about trying to drive as fast as you possibly can without running your car dry. What a cracking battle between a couple of the talented rising stars of Australian sim racing and again side by side at the top of the hill and it's Jackson Suslin Harlow who will, will be on the inside as they head into the left hand and there's contact and it's Suslin Harlow who gets turfed off the road and goes backwards into the fence with a tap from Job Stewart a disaster there for Jackson Suslin Harlow who gets sent off the road we'll get a motion simulation and replay see if we can work out exactly who may potentially have been at fault for that as you can see, they are fighting extremely hard around the outside. Always a risky move. And Jackson, Susan and Harlow there goes in. I think, sadly, that might be on Jackson, who just turns in a fraction too early and cuts across the nose of Job Stewart, who definitely still had overlap at that point in time. 
what a shame because it had been such a high quality battle between those two up to this point. So Job Stewart still leads the race, but now it's the Ferrari of Chris Lavis Revich who finds himself in the position to put the pressure on and be attacking in the contest for the lead of the motor race. Looking at Chris Lazarevich's race and lap times, he's not been fuel saving at all. He's just been going flat out in that Ferrari because he's been lapping in the 218s while we've had other cars in the 222s, 23s and 25s. So Chris Lazarevich, if he can get that Ferrari home on fuel based on the lap time that he's been doing, that would be a remarkable effort. But there's one more twist and turn to the story as well, Lockie. If they cross the finish line right now, they're almost looking at about two laps to go. It all depends when they cross the line. It's two minutes 20 to go. When do they cross the finish line? I think they're just about going to go to one lap to go. It is to the second close on whether or not that is going to be one lap to go or two laps to go. Of course, the timing screens have betrayed me before in this series. And at the moment, it's showing me two laps remaining. If they were fuel saving, they would have had one lap to go. If they go flat out, They've got two laps to go. Well, Aaron Borg's just come into the pit, so he's given it away. He can't make it to the end on fuel based on range. And Job Stewart, he's got his foot down again now, so he must be confident that he's got the fuel on board to get to the end. Up the Kemmel straight they come into the braking zone at Fort Lacombe once again. The other thing as well is the finish line's actually down the hill, isn't it? for this particular race rather than before the uh, source hipping. For this layout, it will be out of the bus stop chicane. And Jackson Susan Harlow, obviously as a result of the damage to the back of his car has slowed considerably. So, so really Jackson, not too confident that he's able to make it to the end of the race. He is lifting and coasting a lot. In fact, he is doing a maximum of 130 kilometers an hour in sixth gear and full on the clutch, no revs whatsoever. But I'm not seeing any white flags at the moment. We have been betrayed in this series before by the uh, timing screen. So I don't want to call it too early, whether this is the final lap or not. But when they came across the line, I did not see that any white flag or any kind of telemetry to show me that it's the last lap of the race. So we'll still need to see. And Chris is now lurching back onto the back of Job Stewart, who was slowing once again. So Job pushed at the start of the lap, but now he's beginning to just back it off again, and Chris is closing in. Nobody knows what's happening here. No one knows when the finish line is. No one knows if they've got the fuel to make it home. So the clock's counting down. The drivers negotiate their way through the high-speed left-hander at Blonde Chamont. There is nothing separating our two race leaders. Job Stewart, our championship leader, who was the winner in round one versus Chris Lazarevich in the Ferrari, who's on debut. There we in go. The Speed Cafe GC3 E-Series. One more and lap. We will have one more lap to go. So finished. who's got the fuel to get home? Who is in conservation mode? Well, Chris Lazarevich can't make it. He's had to come into the pit, so he's out of fuel. We had our suspicions about that car's capability to make it to the chequered flag based on the fact that we didn't think Chris Lazarevich had been fuel saving. So it's Job Stewart who returns to the top of the timing screen when he has the margin of 6.7 seconds over second place James Scott. Andre Heimgartner is going to move up into position number three. And Paul Mansell, the driver on that two-stop strategy, he's right to go full reach to the end. He will cruise on up into the top five. And Jackson Susan Harlow is in a big train of cars. Everyone's fighting around him when they can have the fuel. And he has been passed by Jamie Craig. So Jamie Craig on the two-stop is now past Jackson Susan Harlow. Crucially, you can see a big battle in front between the two Mercedes and Audis who fight their way into the source hairpin. But what is happening for your race leaders? Job Stewart is really slow. He is doing 140 kilometers an hour into the downhill right here. He is struggling big time. He's got nothing in the tank. I tell you what, James Scott has still has some kind of pace compared to the driver in front of Job Stewart. James Scott, I think, may be in a slightly better fuel situation compared to the Pursuit Sim Racing BMW. And Andre Heimgart really, really slow as well. So this is a Bathurst 2014 style finish that we're going to have here with cars running out of fuel with inside of the chequered flag. It's not going to be a problem for Paul Mansell because we know that he's got plenty of fuel on board to make it home. And he's now up into position three in the BMW. Job Stewart 
James Scott, can these cars get to the finish line? They've only got a handful of corners left to run. And here is Paul Mansell, the driver on the two-stop strategy, who was able to go flat out as hard as you like, no worries, and we'll get to the chequered flag. The other cars are going to try and get home on what will be the sniff of an oily rag. Absolutely, you can see down one of the fastest points on the track right now, Joe Stewart has barely got out of fourth gear speed, almost turns across Steve Johnson, and a spin is something you cannot afford right now because you may not have the fuel to turn yourself back around. But right now, Job Stewart is coasting. I'm going to go on board and see what exactly he is doing to save at the moment. He's in sixth gear and he is using as little revs as he can. Down to first gear, he will go. Does he have the power? Does he have the fuel to cross the line? He's accelerating. He's coughing a little bit, but I think that Job Stewart is going to take victory for the second time in two rounds. A brilliant drive on absolutely nothing left in the fuel tank. He'll take victory ahead of second place James Scott. And unbelievably, look how close Paul Mansell on the final lap has got when the rest were doing 240s. He's gone and done a 219. What an unbelievable finish to the motor race there. We knew that they were going to be marginal on fuel after they all came in so early for that pit stop under... Well, it wasn't under safety car conditions, was it? It was at the, the very limit of their first fuel load. And here is Jackson, Susan and Harlow literally limping to the line. We've got cars spinning out of the final corner. And in fact, Jackson, Susan and Harlow was so slow on that final lap that he almost got passed by Chris Lazarevich, even yeah. though Chris Lazarevich, in fact, he did get passed by Chris Lazarevich before the finish line, even though that Chris Lazarevich had to come in for that splash of fuel. And there is Job Stewart. His car has coughed and spluttered and ground to a halt before he's even headed up the hill into Eau Rouge. And that shows just how finally he was cutting it. But it is Job Stewart who wins round number two at the speedcafe.com GT three egg series here at Spa Frankershops he will extend his championship lead at the top of the standings with back-to-back -back round victories that is exactly what I was talking about where the drivers that were involved in that front a pack of cars if any of them decided to pit early they would have potentially won that race such was the pace of uh, Chris Lazarevich towards the end there. Of course, he did finish 43 seconds behind, but he was fuel saving himself for a little bit of time as well. So I think that there was a big missed opportunity out there for one of these drivers. One driver that took the opportunity to full effect though is Paul Mansell, but I do have some upsetting no uh, news for a, uh, a couple of uh, Paul Mansell fans out there. I'm being told by race control that he has actually been handed a 25 second post-race penalty which will promote Reese Cohen up to the podium. It's going to be one of those races, isn't it, where with some of the incidents that we saw, there might be some post-race investigations and some penalties to be handed down. So it could be a case of us not quite knowing what the final results will be until uh, a little bit later on. But here are the provisional results for round number two of the Speed Cafe GT3 A-Series. Job Stewart, your winner. Eight seconds, the official margin back to James Scott at the finish. Paul Mansell provisionally third, but we know that he's got that penalty coming his way. Reese Cohen in fourth position ahead of Jamie Craig, back to Paul Auditore. Tyler Howard in seventh, Michael Gurry in eighth, Max Lachlan Murphy in ninth, and Andre Heimgarten, who was coughing and spluttering on the last lap completing the top 10. Finishing at home in 11th place on an alternate strategy right at the ends there, pitting on the final lap of the race would be Chris Lazarevich. Keen Thornhill would finish in 12th ahead of Jack Boyd, Jackson Susan Harlow, and Ray Oliver, who would round out the top 15. Aaron Borg in 16th with Jane Ransley, Beric Linton, Kobe Williams, and Zach Hanlon in the top 20. Over the page, we go to Jason Makovsky in 21st, back to Ian McMahon. John Martin in 23rd, ahead of David Huzo. Robert Crisdale in 25th position, ahead of Trent Grubel. Ryan Hanley in 27th, and then it was Jack Fafode. Julian Andrews Church in 29th position, and Brady Carr in 30th spot. 31st, we'll go to Stephen Ellery, ahead of Benjamin D'Alia, Lockie Hughes, Cam McDougall, and Jeff Connell, the top 35. With Daniel Yeaman, we saw involved in that big incident, heading down the Kemmel Strait, will finish 36th ahead of Tyrone De Silva, Ben Blaze, Justin Ford, and Zach Nickel, who rounds out the top 40. 
Then we get back to the drivers who were retired or involved in incidents. James Foster and Stephen Johnson both made it to the finish, but problems for Matt Lapino, unfortunately. And then Tyler Collins, Dale Breed, Millie Yarwood, Ben Holiday, Jared Hughes, Sam Batty and Matthew Bruzz all finishing a lap down. Dalton Ellery would sadly be one of the retirements in this race. Seven laps down, Eli Donaldson, Dylan Burst, Oscar Target, Luis Paulo Gallon, and our final driver, who sadly did not finish the race, being Fraser Ross, being your 56-car grid that we had take part in a round number two of the uh, Speed Cafe GT3 E-Series. And <laughs> what a race it was. Indeed. So after that very, very dramatic conclusion to the race, it's now time for the virtual podium presentation. And coming home in third place, congratulations to Race Cohen. Race, what do you make of that one? Yeah, it was a tough race. As soon as I came in for the pit, the first pit, I knew it was going to be close. So I was just on the fuel save the whole time, trying to back off down the straights. I was like doing six seconds off, like for... 10 laps or so so yeah it was weird we saw that you were in quite a big freight train of cars for a lot of the race as well with uh, a few other audi drivers um including tyler howard and uh, a couple of others as well uh how was it being in such a ferocious battle pack for so long uh, i was actually quite cool with it because a lot of them like we're in the a team bpr um so we're all sort of teammates we had Jaden in there which he was pretty clean it was nice um but yeah, I was actually pretty comfortable being in that pack with them. So what are you most enjoying about the Speed Cafe GC3 E-Series so far? Oh, both races have been real close on fuel. So it's been very hairy, both two races in a row. So yeah, it's good fun. And finally, race. Uh, no doubt there's some people in the background that you would like to thank. Oh yeah, shout out to the BPR boys. Let's get it. Good stuff. There he is, Race Cohen. Congratulations, finishing up in third place for round two of the Speed Cafe GC3 A-Series. Coming home in second place, a sensational performance on debut and making it a 1-2 finish for the Altus Esports team, James Scott. And he's standing by for a chat with Bo Albert. James, you don't regularly race in the GT cars. Normally you find yourself in a V8 supercar, but my word, what an introduction to the world of GT racing for you. Yeah, wow, what a race. Um... No preparation, jumped in, um, didn't realise I was racing until about 5 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, jumped in, about 10 laps practice, and um, yeah, that was a crazy race in the end there. It absolutely was. We saw you involved in a whole heap of fights. Of course, early in the race, you found yourself in a big scrap with Chris Lazarevich, and you found yourself in a couple of close moves, especially down the Kemmel Street and into the Lacombe section. How was that battle? Yeah, that was crazy. Um... It was a bit unlucky in the first stint. Um, I started pulling away from him a little bit. There was a uh, lap car that was um, sideways in the uh, bus stop and uh, I lost the spot to him there because I had to take avoiding action. And then, uh, yeah, in the second stint there, he obviously didn't quite realise he needed to save some fuel and was going flat out. Um, so we had some good battles, but then, uh, yeah, I think he had to come into the pits at the end there. And what point in the final stint of the race was it that you actually realized that, oh boy, I actually need to be saving fuel right now. It's going to be extremely tight to the end of the race. Um, well, I had my JRT up uh, all race. And uh, however, the safety car really put my fuel numbers out. It was saying that I was safe on fuel. And then uh, next lap when I checked, I needed to save about eight liters. So um, yeah, I went heavy save there at the end and uh, only just made it. <laughs> Well, it was a fantastic result, of course, qualifying in fourth and then moving yourself up to second. And on the final lap for a moment there, looks like it was almost on chance for a debut race win. James, before I let you go, is there anyone you want to thank? Um, obviously, all the guys at Logitech G, Alter C Sports. Um, they've been great since I come on board. And obviously, all of our sponsors, uh, Logitech G, Astro Gaming, Motion Simulations, and Cube Controls. And obviously, you guys for putting on a great show. There we go. That was James Scott finishing in second place for tonight. But Lockie, I believe you might be standing by for the second time in two weeks with our race winner. Indeed. So our round winner for round number two of the Speed Cafe GT3 A-Series presented by King Chrome Tools. Congratulations to Job Stewart. And Job, you, uh, you certainly had to work hard for that one. You had everything thrown at you from cars like Jackson, Susan and Harlow putting you under pressure early in the race and late in the race as well to then an incredible fuel economy run at the end. Talk us through what it was like from the driver's seat. Yeah, it was super crazy at the start. Um, yeah, I was definitely thinking we were going to have to pit twice. Some people did, but um, yeah, it came to the end and all of a sudden 
saying we weren't going to make it, so yeah, it was pretty crazy at the end. I think lap times ended up being about 20 seconds off the pace, so yeah, it was pretty crazy. So we saw that you were battling it out with Jackson, Susan and Harlow there in the end, and a few laps from home, you had contact with him at the top of the hill heading out of Lacombe. Uh, what was what happened in that incident from your perspective? Uh, I feel like, yeah, Jackson went for the move. It was a fair move, and then he kind of didn't leave that much room going into the corner, and there was, I think it may have been a bit of net code as well, but yeah. In those final few laps, when you realised that you were not going to be able to make it home on a fuel driving flat out, what did you have to try and do to conserve at that point? Uh, just for the first few parts, I was just backing off the end of the straights, and um, yeah, then fully towards the end, I was only going like half throttle down all the straights and full clutching into corners and stuff. How nervous does that make you as a driver when you find yourself in that situation? Pretty nervous as well, especially with all the cars catching up behind. Indeed, but uh, anyway, you still managed to bring it home for the uh, the race victory. And the other interesting thing tonight is that for the second round in a row, you managed to do it without changing tyres in your pit stop. So at the end of the race, car almost out of fuel, tyres are completely worn out. How how hard was it to drive? Um, to be honest, because we were going that slow with the fuel saving, the tyres at the end didn't really make that much of a difference, I didn't think. But um, yeah, if we had it went hard, I'm sure the tyres would have fallen away pretty quick. Good point. Tyres were probably a secondary consideration for you at that point. Um, so this is two round wins in a row for you now in the Speed Cafe GT3 X-Series. What have you most enjoyed about your experience in these first two events? Uh, just the, it's really fun, the strategy that you have to think about, especially both rounds was pretty tight on fuel, so that makes it heaps of fun and adds a whole other element to it, which is pretty great. Before I let you go, Job, no doubt there are some people that you would like to acknowledge behind the scenes. Yeah, just thanks to uh, the series sponsor, King Chrome, and thanks to my team, Pursuit Sim Racing. Um, yeah, thanks to Erebus Academy as well, and thanks to Bandit Performance Racing. Good stuff. There he is, Job Stewart. Back-to-back -back round wins for Job to kickstart the Speed Cafe at GT3 A-Series, which will return for another round next Sunday night. Hope you have enjoyed all of the action from round two of the Speed Cafe GC3 Egg Series. It certainly delivered. It gave us everything, especially with that dramatic fuel saving situation in the closing laps. We'll do it all again next week. Same time, same channel. On behalf of my co-commentator, Bo Albert, our producer, Jay Kennedy, and the entire team behind the scenes, I'm Lachlan Mansell. See you next time. Bye for now. Speedcafe.com, your number one source for all the latest motorsport news and features. Breaking news, live event updates, unprecedented global motorsport coverage, performance motoring news and reviews, all in the palm of your hand, anywhere, anytime. Speedcafe.com, first, fast and free.